call the uh, August 28th school committee meeting to order. And wel welcome everybody. We haven't been here in a while. Uh, before I get started, I, I, I would like to uh, acknowledge do that to bring a cloud over, which is a, a one, one of the most wonderful meetings we have of the year with the introduction of our teachers. But over the next few days, uh, you know, it's gonna be a, a celebration of a wonderful life and legacy of, of Mr. Burbank. Uh, you know, he and his, his, his wife, Rita, uh, Make so, made so many uh, legacies in this community that will live on for, for generations and generations with the, you know, with the Burbank YMCA and the, the Burbank Ice Arena and the Matera Cabin and Memorial Park and, and many other things I probably, you know, where there were things he did. But it was all for the, it was all for the community and and for the and all for the kids, which uh, and, and for you know for active and and passive recreation, uh, just a, and uh, you know I became friends uh, with with Mr. Burbank over the past few years, and just a just a uh, wonderful, uh, kind, uh, just special person. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, on behalf of the schools and the school committee, I just like to. Just to uh, tell, ask everyone to keep his, you know, family uh, in our thoughts over the next few days. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, too. So uh, we'll start this meeting with, as I said, it's it's a, it's you know, there's a few meetings every year, the, <coughs> the end of the year graduation, and, and this is this is so important too, and and uh, you know, we're just so happy to get to see the. Meeting faces with all the names of, of the new the new employees so uh, so uh, I, I guess I'll start um, hi everyone thank you for coming um, before we uh, pass it over to Jen and have her talk a little bit about um, our new employees and introduce uh, our administrators who are awesome uh, who are here um, we do have more of uh, teachers and other leaders that came to, with us to our induction week. Uh, so just a little bit about that. So exciting to have a really successful induction week. We had uh, four days, three on site, and then one in their own buildings. Um, and I was really excited to share the duties uh, with Jen Bovey and uh, Jen Stice. We had um, Lauren Sabella's help, our SROs officers. Um, as well as our tech folks helping out. And uh, we did a new book club this year, which was very exciting. So um, our STEM and humanities coordinators helped organize a book tasting and each new employee uh, got to ask uh, questions and look at different books and then pick their top favorite books and they will join a in live and virtual book club with other members of uh, the team so we're really excited to onboard people I think the feedback we got and we will be sending a feedback form on induction week but it, uh, by all uh, I guess everyone thought it was great, so that was awesome. Uh, just thank you to the team for really helping to onboard our new employees. We have a really spectacular new group here. We're really excited about it. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Jen. Um, thank you, Jen. Hi. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jen Bovey. I'm the HR administrator here for the schools. Um, I just wanted to start off uh, by thanking our central office leadership team, Gail, Jen, Chris, um, for the work that they did all throughout the summer um, to get us ready for the start of school, which I, for my opinion, seems to have gone very well. So um, we're very excited for that. So I wanted to start just by thanking them. Um, and then second, thanking our principals and thanking our directors who also have worked tirelessly over the summer to not only bring on new hires, but a number of other things simultaneously getting ready for the school year, but um, as a main objective, bringing on some what I think is 
probably one of our best new batch of new hires. I mean, every year they're great, but we are, Chris and I even had a side conversation about how excited we were during induction uh, to see this group. So um, without further ado, what I will do is I'm going to um, kick it back to Chris, who is going to kind of announce um, our principals, have them come up, and they will be able to uh, introduce their new staff to you. Thank you. So our uh, first person to come up uh, that we'll be introducing um, the new, some of the new staff members at the high school that were able to come today is actually a new staff member himself. So we are welcoming him and <laughs> putting him immediately to work, which is uh, the Reading way. So uh, Craig Murray is our assistant principal at the high school. We are so excited to have Greg join our team. He comes uh, from Stoneham High as an assistant principal, seven years of experience. He's a former English teacher and coach. Uh, he's also working on his doctoral degree, and the search committee just was so impressed uh, with his work ethic, his enthusiasm, and really the relationships that he builds. So uh, already, I can tell you, he's hit the ground running, and I, feel, I just said to him the other day, I feel like you've always been here. Um, so he's working really closely with Principal Boynton, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, we're both moving our new college freshman in uh, tomorrow, um, but mine's local and hers is not local. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to present Craig uh, to the team. Welcome, Craig. Thank you. And, and you know, I, it, in terms of the relationships, uh, I do have to say that Reading made this so easy. I mean, they really did. It really underscores the community. Um, all the folks, um, it, it, it felt during the interview process that I had worked here for a long time because, frankly put, everyone just made me feel so at home. The inclusiveness, the community was really, truly something special. So I really, it's a tip of the cap to you guys because uh, it, it, it just feels good. It does. So I have the uh, privilege and the honor to um, introduce our new staff and teachers. So um, at RMHS, uh, the science department is welcoming uh, Helen Day. I didn't see Helen, but I'm going to say a few words about her. Uh, Ms. Day is a graduate of the University of Rhode Island and uh, UNH. She's a Massachusetts native who has experience in teaching at both the high school and college level. She comes to Reading from East Providence High School, where she taught ninth grade earth, space, and physical science, and she is excited to have the opportunity to be teaching biology once again. Uh, Mr. Farron, Mr. Mark Farron is a member of the science department as well, a graduate from Salem, excuse me, a graduate of Salem State University and National University of La Jolla, California. He is a Massachusetts native who has over 16 years experience teaching at the high school level in both Massachusetts and California. Most recently, Mark worked as a physics and engineering teacher at Essex North Shore Agricultural and Technical School. Mark is also a major in the United States Army Reserve, where he has served as, where he has served as civil affairs plans officer in the U.S. Army Reserve since 1997. The English department welcomes Holly Beth Murphy. Ms. Murphy is right to our left. Ms. Murphy joins the English department from Swampscott High School. She holds a BA in English and a BS in secondary education from the University of Vermont and is currently pursuing her master's degree at Simmons University. Holly has had a passion for talent. Holly has had a passion and talent for a tech theater. She will be teaching grades 9, 10, and 11 this year. Want me to read it again? No. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Stay there. The math department welcomes Andrea Bonifiglio. Ms. Bonifiglio is joining the math and business department this year to teach freshman algebra one and junior honors pre-calculus. Andrea is originally from Ohio, where she earned her BA in design at Ohio State. She completed her master's in secondary education at UMass Boston. Andrea has worked as a professional and a math teacher at several local high schools, most recently Melrose. In her spare time, Andrea enjoys gardening, taking care of her dog, and metal detecting. The Special Education Department welcomes Brittany Francis for a Crossroads teacher. Ms. Francis has served as a special education teacher in Tennessee for the past seven years. She has her MED, excuse me, Master of Education in Special Education and in Reading Specialty. The Special Education Department also welcomes Jillian Sullivan as a social worker. Jillian worked at the middle school level in Lawrence for the past three years as an adjustment counselor. Her position in the high school setting was at a bilingual K-12 in Salem, Mass. Prior to working in the school setting, Jillian worked in the hospital setting for 10 years as a social worker. Also in the Special Education Department, Tracy Jorgensen as a paraeducator. Tracy is entering her eighth year as a paraeducator, three years at the middle school level in Peabody, and the last four years at Essex Tech. Her strengths in the area, excuse me, her strengths are in the area of English literature. The guidance department welcomes Ryan Sacco. 
Sorry, I'm if he comes in. <laughs> need a picture. <clears throat> I'm already messing it up. I, feel, <laughs> I, I, mean, I can feel it. <laughs> Mr. Saka was one of the new guidance counselors at RMHS, working with the students previously, excuse me, working with the students previously on Joanne Gregowitz's caseload. Mr. Sacco comes to us with an experience working at the high school level in both Methuen and Melrose Public Schools. Mr. Sacco received his undergraduate degree at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, majoring in sociology, and his graduate degree in school counseling at Salem State. Mr. Sacco was eager to get started and, and meet all of his students and families, which he has yeah. already, very much so, <laughs> very much so. The Fine and Performing Arts Department welcomes Anna Wentlett. Ms. Wentland is our new pre-K to 12 Fine and Performing Arts Department Chair. Before coming to the high school, Anna was the choral director and general music teacher at Coolidge Middle School. She has a master's degree in educational leadership from Boston University, a bachelor's degree in music education from the Crane School of Music, and a certificate in community music from York St. John University. In addition to teaching, Anna is also active as a clinician and author with several music education resources in print. She is looking forward to diving into the high school performing arts program this fall. The administration is me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to read my, that's, be. the nursing department is welcoming Mary Juliana. Ms. Juliana joins us as a school nurse for RMHS in the RISE program as well as our new interim director of nursing. She received her bachelor's degree from Boston College, is a nationally certified school nurse, and has over 30 years experience in pediatric nursing. Mary is a Reading resident, parent of three Reading Public School graduates, and has been the school nurse at Joshua Eaton Elementary School for the past 10 years. She is excited to be at the high school and to provide leadership in health and wellness in the district. Those are our new employees. All right. All right. Come on over with the picture, Craig. All right, next up we have um, Ms. Mrs. Marchant from Coolidge Middle School. Come on up. Thanks, Sarah. Good evening, members of the school committee, and thanks for having us here tonight. It is a pleasure to be here tonight, and it's a pleasure to introduce two teachers from Coolidge um, who are new this year, obviously. Um, they were both unable to be here tonight because they are both parents of very young children, so it compromised with the bedtime routine, so I apologize. But first, firstly, I would like to introduce Lisa Wistrom, who has been hired as our music and chorus teacher to replace Anna Wentland, who you just saw. <laughs> Lisa received her bachelor's degree in music education at Keene State College in New Hampshire. She taught for three years at the secondary level in Connecticut before moving to Massachusetts, where she, where she received her master's of education from Boston University. She taught for three years in Lynn Public Schools, then the Boston Public Schools for the last five years. She is happy to be joining the Reading Public Schools for her 12th year as a public school teacher. Secondly, we welcome Kevin Phillips in our Compass program as our Compass program teacher. Kevin comes to Reading after working as a special education teacher in Arlington for the past six years. He received his master's in severe disabilities as well as an autism endorsement certificate from Leslie University. When he was in his undergraduate program, he volunteered with local programs playing sports and games with elementary and middle school aged children. He looks forward to collaborating and working on a team with fellow special education educators and professionals. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Next up, we have Mrs. Shanklin from Parker. Thank you. I'm thrilled to introduce, I have four new hires this year. And I have one out of the four that's here tonight, so I will have you come up last. Okay. So, um, so you don't have to stand here the whole time. Um, so I have Shelby McCoy, who is teaching seventh grade math. She graduated from the UTeach program at UMass Lowell. That's their STEM education program. And she's coming to us from teaching for a year as a seventh grade math teacher at the Methuen Public Schools. Um, I am happy to introduce Nancy Folk. She actually was a long-term sub for us last year in eighth grade social studies, and she's continuing on in our eighth grade social studies um, program. 
She has several years teaching middle school in middle school social studies in California, and most recently comes to us from, from teaching English at the Lexington Public Schools. She's certified as both an English teacher and a social studies teacher. We also have Nicole Schweitzer. She's teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth grade health. Um, she comes to us from teaching and developing curriculum in the Woburn Public Schools in grades K to five. Um, and so we're excited to have her. And finally, um, I'd like to introduce Terry Bello. Very exciting, she is teaching, she is our new seventh, um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade small group math special education teacher. She comes to us with um, a varied background as a social worker. She worked as a social worker at Dana Hall, and she was also a lead math teacher at the Landmark School for five years. Um, she's certified special educator and math teacher. So welcome and thank you. All right, next up we'll do Barrows, and we have Mrs. Levitt here. Thank you so much for this opportunity to come and present our new staff. I was really excited because this was my first year getting to hire new teachers. Last year I did not have this opportunity, so all three of my new hires are here. Christine Crocker, I'm going to go alphabetical. So Christine Crocker is our new school psychologist and joins us from the Methuen Public Schools, where she was a school psychologist at the Tenney School for 13 years. Prior to that, she was in the Wakefield Public Schools in the same role for seven years. She's a graduate from Merrimack and did her bachelor's there, and then Tufts was where she did her master's in CAGS. Christine's colleagues described her as their go-to person and shared that her willingness to contribute her expertise to school and district initiatives was amazing. She brings years of experience to Barrows and is already making wonderful connections with students, families, and staff in this important role. Welcome. Emily Felter is a special ed teacher in our learning center and joins us from completing her bachelor and master's studies at Endicott College. She has experience from her field work in all elementary grades. Her dean of education shared that she is exceptional and her strengths include her professionalism and warmth, which I have already been seeing in the opening of school. Welcome. Finally, Jacqueline Lytle is our new fourth grade teacher. She completed her education at Emanuel College and American International College, and for the past four years, Jacqueline has taught third grade at St. Patrick's School in Lowell. She also recently completed her literacy coach certification through Lesley University, and spent some time last, last year, she was third grade teacher as well as coaching at that school. Jacqueline's colleagues described her as exceptional with a strong, positive presence every single day. She is also having a great start to the school year with families reporting how excited their children are. So I welcome these ladies to the Barrows School. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, uh, we have Mrs. Ippolito from Joshua Eaton. Good evening, thank you for having us once again. It's such an exciting night. Um, I have six new staff members, um, two who could attend this evening. So I'll start off with the staff members who are unable to attend. So in our special education department, um, we have welcomed Mrs. Tadra Turco. Um, she has her bachelor's degree from Northeastern University and her master's degree from Endicott College. She has previously worked in the Newburyport Public Schools as their ESY coordinator, as well as learning center teacher. Um, and she's had a terrific start here at Joshua Eaton, and we're so happy to have her. Um, in terms of our speech and language pathologist, um, we were able to hire Mrs. Catherine Boylerand. She has her master's degree from Emerson uh, College in communication disorders, and her bachelor's degree from Bridgewater State University. Uh, she has worked as a speech and language pathologist for nine years prior to coming to Joshua Eaton. Uh, we have welcomed Mrs. Emily Trevejo. She's our new school nurse at Joshua Eaton. 
Uh, she has her master's degree from Boston College and her bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts in nursing. She has extensive nursing experience at some of the premier Boston hospitals, as well as she has done work all across the state in terms of quality improvement initiatives in pediatrics. Um, as our uh, ki new kindergarten teacher, we have Mrs. Leslie Marr. Uh, she has her master's degree from Leslie University. She has 12 years of kindergarten um, teaching experience to bring to Joshua Wheaton, which includes her passion to bring art and creativity into the classroom. And then I have my part of my first grade squad over here. <laughs> first, I'd like to introduce you to Mrs. Crystal Varhees. She graduated with a bachelor's from UMass as, and then received her master's degree from AIC, both in early childhood education. She has spent the last five years working within the Belmont Public Schools. And I just want to say um, I hired her two weeks before school started, and you would never know it. Her room looks spectacular, and she's just wrapped her arms around her first graders, and they love her already. <laughs> then I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Colleen Martin. She has a bachelor's and master's degree from Endicott College in elementary education and special education, respectively. Uh, we are excited to have her as part of our team. Again, they are already truly a squad at the first grade at Joshua Eaton. And we are excited to have all these new team members become part of our already awesome team at Joshua Eaton. Thank you so very much. Next up, we have Ms. Levesque from Killam. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. It's such a fun night. Um, I was fortunate this summer to be able to hire three new individuals to our staff, two of which could be with us. Um, so I will introduce the two that are here first and then um, our individual who couldn't be here. So joining our kindergarten team is Ms. Mrs. Ashley Wheaton. We are so excited because she's returning to her roots. Ashley is a graduate of the Reading Schools. She has spent the last seven years teaching kindergarten in the Lynn Public Schools, and we scooped her right up. Um, we were just so excited by her enthusiasm when she came into our classrooms. She received her undergraduate degree in liberal studies and education from Curry College, and her master's degree in early childhood from Salem State. So we welcome Mrs. Wheaton home. We also are welcoming Ms. Melissa Greenberg to our new therapeutic support program. She is our social worker in the program. She has been working um, in the past few years as a re residential therapeutic setting um, in a school for uh, children that are familiar to our TSP program. She's been the school clinician there, providing trauma-sensitive um, therapy for the families as well as the kids, and um, has been known to manage a large group of staff with enthusiasm and confidence. So we are so excited to have her with us um, and the strength-based approach that she's bringing to our TSP program. Finally, um, the individual who couldn't be here tonight is a new fourth grade teacher. Her name is Julie Vital. She has um, joined us from Virginia. Uh, Julie uh, flew in multiple times this spring to make sure she was present for all of her interviews and came in like a uh, you know, breath of fresh air. So we couldn't say no to her. We were so excited to have her. So she just moved here from Virginia um, during the month of July. She received her undergraduate degree in early elementary education um, and her master's degree from education from James Madison University in Virginia and our one goal this year is to make her a Boston sports fan so <laughs> that's our, our plan so welcome to our welcome. two staff members Yay. that are here and to Mrs. So clearly, uh, at the end of the week, my alphabetical order is a little out. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Hendricks is here with Birch Meadow. Uh, Mrs. Hendricks, could you please come up? 
Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here this evening. Um, at Birch Meadows School, we have three new hires in special education. Jackie Payton has joined us as our team chairperson. She has worked in the Lowell Public Schools as a principal, special education administrator, and a special education liaison, and is bringing a lot of very deep special education experience to our school. Molly Bird joins us as a substantially separate teacher in our kindergarten to second grade COMPASS program. She's been working in special education for many years and most recently was working in a substantially separate classroom in Methuen. And Andrea Cote is joining us in our learning center. Prior to this, she worked for four years as a learning center special education teacher and a reading interventionist in the Chelmsford Public Schools. Our new school psychologist is Ashley Dennis. She finished her graduate degree at Tufts University this year and has done internships in both the Winchester Public Schools and Boston Public Schools. Allison Kramer joins us as a general education second grade teacher. She has worked in several long-term substitute positions, including a full year in a kindergarten in Westwood. And she did a full year reading internship in the first grade in the Andover Public Schools. She's also certified both in special education and general education as is Lauren Reedy, our new fourth grade teacher. She has taken a general education role in fourth grade, but prior to this has been working in special education in the Middleton Public Schools. So she is also dual, doubly certified. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Dr. King from Wood End. Good evening, thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to welcome two teachers to the Wood End family. Um, both were not able to be here this evening, but we're very excited to have them. Kathy Burton is a fifth grade teacher. She's joining us from the Winchester Public Schools. Before that, um, Kathy also taught in North Carolina. She just moved back to the area. She completed her bachelor's degree in government and sociology at St. Lawrence University, and her master's degree in elementary education from Leslie University. She also enjoys working as a camp counselor during the summer, favorite place of mine in Vermont. Um, so she just returned from that as well. Emma Connery is our new school psychologist, and she comes to us from the Melrose Public Schools, where she just completed her internship at both elementary and secondary. Emma graduated from UMass Amherst with her bachelor's in psychology before receiving her master's degree. And most recently, she just completed her tags school psychology at Northeastern with a concentration in applied behavior analysis. She's worked as the director for the YMCA summer program for the past two summers, but she actually took time off this summer and spent time traveling in Europe. So we're thrilled to welcome both Kathy and Emma to the brand team and to the Wildcat community. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Bach. A uh, Bostwick, did I say it right? Bostwich? A uh, Bostwick, Ke Kelly, thank you, <laughs> from, <laughs> from our RISE community. Good evening. I'm uh, happy to announce that Tracy Tompkins will be joining our RISE preschool team. Um, she's going to be teaching the three half days in the morning and afternoon sessions. She um, has worked for Reading Public Schools for the past eight years at uh, Birch Meadow, and she was a wonderful paraeducator over there and did some subbing over there. Uh, I was actually the team chair over there when she was at Birch, and she was always the person that you would want to um, include into activities that uh, children who might need a little extra support. So always call Tracy, put Tracy in that classroom and she's the person to go in there. She holds a bachelor's degree from Salem State College, a master's degree from um, in moderate disabilities from Bay Path University, and she has a uh, special education license, pre-K to eight, and an elementary education license as well. And before uh, working for Reading Public School, she was a preschool teacher for two years in the private, at a private preschool. So welcome, Tracy.
So last up, we have uh, Dr. Stice is going to uh, talk about a district-wide position uh, that we was recently onboarded to Reading. So um, as you've heard, there's been a lot of new special education staff, which has been amazing. Um, and we are so happy to have everybody and be part of the team. The last person um, that we've just hired is a brand new um, BCBA. Her name is Heather Grada Durbeck. She actually comes to us with a wealth of experience from private practice and consulting in schools. She has a tremendous background um, working in homes with families to ensure generalization of skills as well. So we are really fortunate to have her joining our team and she's already jumped right in and started meetings, um, especially at RISE, <laughs> where uh, Ms. Boswick was very happy to have her. So we are very thrilled um, and fortunate to have her joining the Reading team. So that's our new uh, freshman class of employees. We have a great and powerful group. We're really excited. And thank you and, thank you for and coming. welcome. We can take a, a one minute yeah. recess. I'd like to uh, call the meeting back to order. Uh, so we'll we'll go into our, our regular agenda now, uh, starting with uh, public input. If there's anything for for anything that's not on the agenda, Ms. Stone, if you want to. Um, Mary Ann Downing, Heather Drive. So. I would warn the school committee to hold on to their chairs because I come only to praise today. <laughs> so I want to, you're pro I'm probably going to give you a preview of what's coming later, but um, I've had some different interactions with the central office staff this summer, and I just want to tell you all how awesome they've been because they've gotten so much done. In, particularly, in particular, um, Mrs. Kelly and her staff, they sat down with me in August, um, I'm sorry, in July for almost a couple of hours to talk about um, the status of the curriculum guides, what are the middle school math improvements, the new fall elementary report card coming back. It was like she was checking off my wish list with every everything, but she got things done. All of the high school core course curriculum guides are done, and that's just a tremendous accomplishment. And between her and Mrs. Dowd, They've been great with communication at the start of the year. And I just think, and I raised an issue even with Mrs. Dowd this week about um, the town's doing paving. It's going to be on the high school bus route. It's a bad timing. She was on it. She was responsive. She got it done. And um, I'm going to relay another compliment that came from someone else who I bet you can guess, which is there's some people are very thrilled. We don't know how. Mrs. Dowd and Mrs. Stice did it, but you've got Rise Music back, and there's thrilled parents. There's one especially thrilled parent, who I won't name, but you know who it is. So 
you, you guys are doing great. It's been an amazing summer, and as a parent, I really appreciate it. You can, I feel like everything's happening. Can we ask, I'll, I'll ask for Rebecca about the math paths, but I'll probably be pushing it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chair, move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second. Is there any comments or any? All those in favor? Five, zero. Now we'll uh, go in. Six. Six, 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 six zero. zero. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> numbers matter according to numbers. <laughs> we'll go into uh, reports now. John, did you have a report? No. I do. I have a bunch of reports, actually. And I am on my computer because I, my printer wasn't working. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was the privilege of being able to participate in prof professional development um, here. And I'm going to let Miss Kelly talk about that in depth, but it was awesome being able to work alongside the teachers um, on this, the two courses, and I'll let Miss Kelly talk about that. Um, and then the, um, I'll talk about the ad hoc committee for human rights. Um, discussions continue about what the mission and structure of our eventual human rights organization should be. The co-chairs, select board members, Andy Friedman and Ann Landry presented and got approved a new organization for the ad hoc in order to enable equal voices for the diverse stakeholders, um, all of the diverse stakeholders in our town um, and those that come in and are a part of our town who don't live here. The committee will now work on a consensual con consensus building model with the elected members voting what the committee has decided. The voting members will be the two select board members, two school committee members, and the board of trustee um, board member. Okay, Rakasa update. Is it okay if I just go in a row? Yeah, I, I actually just had a question on that. Uh, do we need to appoint school committee members or do no, we continue with the there. ones we continue they're actually appointed by the select board so Ms. Webb and I are appointed to that and also Ms. Kelly yeah. is also attending those meetings. I just wanted to make sure yeah. they weren't expecting us. To nope. nope, we're good, thank you. Um, the meeting for Rakasa was yesterday and as always um, Ms. McNampara was incredibly prepared with a packet of um, updates. So I know time is one of the messages I've been getting is to be concise and short. So I don't want to sell them short, but I know that they're coming on September 12th to present. So mm -hmm. they will go more in depth about the youth risk survey results and other things that are going on. I want to highlight that the um, annual meeting is coming up on September 25th at Jordan's. Big thanks to Jordan's for hosting that. Um, and it will be um, the movie of Chris Herons, which refocuses us on prevention and how people get addicted, not just on the more positive approaches to treatment. Um, Rakas is putting out a call for volunteers if you're interested, anybody on the school committee or anybody out there in becoming a board member and participating in this Rakasa, we need you. There are board positions open um, and so they asked us to reach out to our stakeholders to invite people to apply. And you can get more information from me or from Erica McNamara. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you to the Women's Club of Reading for the donation towards the cost of the William James Interface program. I want to point out that there are cards in the back. It's a program that matches people and their insurance up to services that might be needed for mental health. It's an awesome program. I know firsthand that
people have used it and been really helped by it. Um, so if you also, if you want to know more, go on the RACASA website. The cards are in the back. You can also go to them. Um, it's an expensive program, but we've had help to afford it. Um, they're talking about going up in price. We hope they don't. But um, thank you to the organizations that have donated, one of whom um, who enabled us is Representative Dwyer before he retired. He actually um, earmarked $10,000 for Reading's Ricasa, which was incredibly helpful. Um, and let's see. Um, also, thanks to DA Ryan, our schools all have Narcan because she donated them. So 16 doses across our schools, which can get very expensive, but she's really determined to make sure that they're here and they need to be here so they would be here but she made sure they were paid for so um, that was awesome and um, updates from the select board and the um, Rakasa about the underage drinking and there was an issue before the select board and Rakasa discussed that but what they also um, highlighted was the impact that the um, Reading Public Schools policies to deter the end and support the students who are dealing with issues around underage drinking that that has really made a difference in the number of kids that are partaking the numbers are going down but they also highlighted that Reading's numbers are high and as are the states so um, it's not gone the problem but um, thank you to the school committee for the policies that are, and to our th athletic department um, for the policies that are helping to improve the situation. Um, and I'm also going to let Ms. Kelly talk about um, the, oh, maybe not, the, um, I was able to attend Birch Meadows opening professional development where they brought urban improv. I wasn't going to talk about that because each school did different something different, so feel free to talk about that, Linda. Um, thank you. It'll be very brief. Just it was awesome to see the teachers in their element being challenged by the situations that urban improv introduced around bias in the schools and how they have challenging, the teachers have challenging moments all day long, and they enabled the teachers to um, improv how they would respond to it and I just wanted to remark on the final improv really put um, Julia Hendricks the principal on the spot and um, she had to respond to a situation um, where a, uh, just a situation where a parent was calling upset about something that happened and what she did was basically illustrated how she has the children and the teachers she has their backs while also caring very much about the families and their concerns and it came across really powerfully and so I just wanted to share that I had that great experience and just want to highlight again please attend the annual meeting you'll learn so much by going both from the movie and the updates from Rakasa. thanks thank you no. so just one thing I forgot to mention Board of Selectmen is are, is going to do a, a proclamation uh, for Nelson Burbank and at the first football game on September 13th. So, wants to attend. The other thing is uh, the town manager had asked me to uh, sit on the assessment for the police new police chief. So. I, Dr. Doctor gave the report on the ad hoc, which I'm also on, and so that work is continuing, trying to figure out when the whole group can get together next. Um, also, the liaison to a track, but we haven't actually been able to have a quorum and have a meeting this summer. It's been it's really tricky with people's schedule, so I know we're trying to have a meeting in September. Uh, but overall, a track right now is very low in terms of resources and participants, and so that's. Um, I don't know if we're caught sort of in the middle of waiting, it's somewhat 
people aren't stepping up to come on board because you've got the ad hoc committee doing this piece of work. So I think that that's probably you know causing a little bit of the downturn in the volunteers and the participation. But there's, we're still trying to see how we can you know contribute. Um, last thing that we did was on the common with the sign um, around diversity. So we were unable to pull together a joint effort with the clergy for a picnic in July. That's sort of where we are. Sure. Um, so select board meeting, uh, a couple of quick updates from that that weren't already mentioned. Um, I think most of the town knows, but MassDOT had a meeting last night as well about the repaving of 28, uh, which is likely to impact our bus related. We have three bus stops right on route, right on Main Street that are in the paving zone. So just something to be aware of. And From what we've been having meetings with the, we had multiple meetings this week with the police department and my understanding for the mass dot is majority of that will be occurring overnight that most of the work will be done in the overnight hours but they'll be providing us updates they, they did say at, at the meeting the other day that there will be nighttime work and daytime work they're starting in the night but there will be some daytime work hopefully it just won't be during our commute yeah, time yeah. right and most of it's between um, nine and two right so we'll be relatively safe in that regard um, one uh, another um, update there is there were supposed to be two financial forums this fall, uh, one September 18th and one in October. The, the September 18th one has been canceled, um, and they're only going to be the one in October as of right now. That was a joint meeting between FinCom School Committee and Select Board, so we'll have to adjust our calendar appropriately to align to that. Um, the there was also a rather large conversation about lighting um, for our athletic fields uh, in Birch Meadow in particular. The Reading Rec Committee uh, went forward asking for permanent lighting on Birch for pretty much the entire fall. Not permanent, temporary, but for the entire fall, so it's up all the time. And they asked for provisional lighting on Parker, um, and one of the youth boards around here came and asking for more than provisional lighting on Parker. Um, you know, and, and with regards to, that's where I was wearing another hat as well, with regards to Birch Meadow as a grass field versus Parker as a turf field and the fundamental usage of those. So. They were sent back to the recreation board essentially, but there might be something else coming out of that. Uh, and you already talked about the police chief hiring process. So, thank you. And your reports are in new business, so that they're in our updates. Yeah. So uh, now we I'd like to uh, address the uh, the operating protocols that everybody mm -hmm. got a copy of. Mr. Chair, move to accept the revised school committee operating protocols. Second. Second. And now I'd like to open it up to discussion. Is there any discussion? Yes. I actually have a question slash suggestion. Um, under the role, I know that the school committee is not, our purview is not the teachers. However, um, our purview is the resources for the teachers. Um, and their work environment. Um, and so the fourth bullet down, I'm not sure if this fits somewhere else or in this protocol. Um, the fourth bullet down on that first page, it says advocating for the needs, interest, and achievement of all students in our district. And I think the teachers are on the ground and I think that part of our job is to advocate for them as well. So I know it's a new topic on this, but is that a potential? I mean, we are also the body that does the contract negotiation with the teachers, and I think that um, the interest and achievement of all of our students really is that's the foundational piece. We all understand we can't do that unless we are bringing in amazing teachers, providing the supports, and clearly we're providing a lot of supports for students when you look at the breakdown of all these teachers that we just brought in. So I would be a little uncomfortable with that because of um, just any potential, just issues with our other critical role. Um, I, ag I agree with the uh, point of the importance of advocating for resources, but I do feel like that's covered by the next bullet identify and advocating for the appropriate resources to advance the mission. So mm. to the extent that supporting teachers is advocating for resources, I feel like this covers it. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's, um, 
applied all, all around and, and also with the, you know, the point that the teachers' contracts are with the school committee and, and not, not anybody else. So, and that's part of what we sign up for when we ratify that contract is to provide that, that work environment. Actually, the first statement also speaks to that too because it's really that the Reading students receive the best education possible. And so that's not possible unless you provide resources to teachers, um, outstanding teachers. Every single person we hired is master's plus, right? Or in the process, a couple were so in the process, but which is pretty amazing. That that doesn't happen in other industries. Yes, I appreciate those reflections, and I understand where they're coming from, and that's why I approach this with a little trepidation, knowing the the contractual positions that we have. Um, one of the things that has been discussed in a lot of the professional development that I've done is the important of importance of words and being explicit. And so I just was thinking about how important it is for the teachers to actually hear that we're, um, in, there's a difference between them being implied in the protocols and them seeing themselves there. And so that's where I was coming from on that. Um, so I don't know, where else it would go. Um, So, um, I don't know so if the, um, last the um, last paragraph is for <coughs> conduct. Um, the school committee recognizes the important of working, importance of working collaboratively with town officials, residents, and other stakeholders to improve our schools and will actively seek ways to enlist their support in our, for our efforts, when, whether there could be a sentence there. I don't, I don't really feel like it, it is necessary, but I definitely, I don't think it would go there because that sentence is really points pointing to the other groups that we work with sort of outside the school environment. So I don't think I would <coughs> um, um, add it there. I think. Um, I was thinking more a separate sentence mm -hmm. um, below that that says something about the appreciation and support of our teachers and educational staff. I know, maybe um, <clears throat> sticking with that fourth bullet uh, where it says advocating for the needs, interests, and achievement of all students in our district. And to that end, including, uh, including the including providing the appropriate resources for our I, teachers, and our staff. And teachers. I think we have policy that really defines yeah. that. Our policies around what we do for financially, I can't, um, I didn't bring my list with me, but those policies are really explicit and talk about that it is our duty as a school committee to advocate for that and provide the resources, not, not, um, without care for the uh, ability of the, the town and the taxpayers, but we are supposed to do that. So I, I think that's really clear. And this is, you know, this document is not meant to spell out every piece of our, I don't know, 60, 80, Tom, how many policies, right? Probably more. Yeah, <laughs> some odd. So I don't, I, I feel like I'm not probably gonna support a, um, amendment to change to add that. So let me just say one other thing to that then and I just re say it like this and advocating for the needs, 
interest and achievement of all students in our district and to that end provide our teachers and staff with the resources to do so <coughs> next is exactly says i mean yeah. identifying yeah. and advocating for the appropriate resources to advance yeah, the mission I'm not, and vision yeah, i'm trying yeah, exactly. to yeah i know so let her i mean I think I, I totally understand where you're coming from. But it's I mean, in the second, the next one. It is in the next one. I, it's, and, I, and I understand what you're trying to say from a very specific, you know, call out teachers. I mean, we can't get our job done. It's, this di district doesn't work without teachers. They're critical. Um, but from our role perspective, that's what this is focused on, is how we as a group talk and how we work together and what our charter and mandate is essentially, right? Um, so I think my perspective and i'd be willing to even <clears throat> one of the things before i say this one of the things that uh, we heard in the last meeting was this should be reviewed more regularly than it was right so it's entirely possible that there's a teacher sitting out there watching us that say you know it's really important that you put something in here so i'm i'm happy to say we can reopen it at a, some, at a, some, at a later point in time but from my perspective teachers are fully covered mm -hmm. in that appropriate resources um, that's not just money that's people that's there's there's more human capital in this organization than there is in anything. 83% of our budget is human capital, right? Which is a huge portion. That's, that's really where it comes from. Um, so I'm personally not thinking we need to add anything yet. If there's an outcry that says, yes, it's really critical and important, we can reconsider it. But again, I think this is focused on how we work together and what our role is in the community. And that resource is teachers in many cases, from my perspective. I hear you and oh sorry I have a different question but go ahead I hear you and I understand that and I understand it from the school committee position um, last year was a very difficult year and it was a difficult contractual year and so in my gestalt of everything going on I want part of my motivation was to say we're listening and that we're trying to make sure that when we are making these difficult decisions which are not just based on needs but based on resources and money that are available and our stakeholders in the town you know keeping in sight that we were on we were um i don't know the right word privileged with the override the support of what our needs were and so that doesn't get lost but at the same time I want I wanted the teachers to be um, to know that they're explicit and maybe this conversation for now does that um, and we'll think about it and like Mr. Wise says renew again I don't want to belabor it but I just want to I guess also plant that seed because we're here for the students and we're here because the teachers enable us to do the best things to educate our whole children. As Mrs. Stice so aptly, I mean, the presentation on Monday morning was amazing, but it's so important. And our teachers are working at that every day, every moment of every day. Uh, I just have a question. Yes, so this, um, we will, there is a signature. I don't see it here, but the copy will have, um, that we'll all sign this. Yeah. If we vote this, then we'll be signing it, right? Because the the other copy or the the last page is somewhere. Maybe it just didn't get printed. But one of the things we had had everyone's it name. Did have signatures, yeah. So we're supposed to. Okay. If, once we approve that, um, I just I'll just say I feel really comfortable with this in terms of the things that we're saying here around providing the best possible education, the work we did last time around aspiration and smart goals, uh, right for the district. Um, so those certainly are assuring those resources, um, developing the policies that support the vision. We can't execute the vision without all these uh, fine teachers and the resources to support them. Um, so I feel com comfortable with this and would go forward with it. Yes. Just before we close the teacher conversation, um, I'll say that, you know, in I'll harken back again just a few months ago, campaign-wise. Before sitting here, teachers do want to be heard more. I think that's that's there's truth there, um, and I don't know whether it's now is the right time 
from an agenda perspective. We've put other things built into that agenda section. And it's not our job necessarily to manage them, but it is our job to hear them, right? I mean, and make sure that we are, if we don't hear them, we can't advocate for the right resources. We can't make sure that our policies are efficient and effective. I mean, we may put a policy in place that's completely unworkable. But if we don't hear from them, we can't do that, right? So if that might go towards what you're going towards, Linda, a little bit, it might be a compromise if people are willing to consider that, is put something in the agenda section that says on an annual, biannual basis, whatever, collectively with the administrative team, not by ourselves, because they're not our staff, right? But collectively with the administrative team, have a listening session. I mean, where we open the floor and say, we're all ears. You are, you are their employees, you know, et cetera. But we want to hear how things are working. What's going well? What's not going well? What can, where can we sharpen the pencils and really add something else? Because um, ultimately, that needs to bubble up so that we can advocate mm. for that. Now, yes, it does come and it will come via the collective expertise here and then, you know, Dr. Doherty as, as well. But sometimes it's good to hear and be heard from the ground, for lack of a better way to say it. I don't know if anybody's interested in considering an agenda-related topic or not, or maybe we just table it for next conversation, so. I think that would be something that yeah, the chair and vice chair would think about. talk about as agenda. Yeah, I mean, but we've, we've particularly put subsections in here from an agenda perspective with regards to planning for goals and other things. That's the reason why I bring it up now, mm -hmm. is if we want to say, from a protocol perspective, the way we operate, because we want to hear from our constituents, both from the, re the residents, which we say here respectfully, right? We added that word as well, but also from the teachers, then, and in a structured fashion, not in an ad hoc fashion necessarily, but it might be worth putting a line about a regular agenda item to hear from the teachers. I'm not sure that the protocol is the right place to do that. I think, it it's, a, I think it's a great, um, you know, topic and something that could be added. I also think there's other places where we mentioned stakeholders, which of course, mm -hmm. they're part of that key stakeholder base. Yes. I'm actually going to sound like a hypocrite here, <laughs> but I want to be really careful that we maintain the line of supervision that the teachers have, that people don't jump over their supervisors to come to us. That's not at all what I was saying. Like, I think that they have people to talk to who have their best interests in mind. Um, their principals, their, their super, their, um, the assistant superintendents, there are people for them to talk to like that. Um, but then we get, as I think Mr. Wise was saying, then we get that information from those appropriate people that, and we're just saying that we will consider those needs as we hear them. Um, so, so that's my, my sort of caution about um, putting it in as though it's going to be a part of our meeting aside from the usual presentations. Um, because they are doing the presentations and much appreciated for that. Um, yeah, I mean, they, the teachers pre present at almost every meeting on right. something. I mean, they're not coming to a meeting and asking for more resources or whatever, but, uh, and I don't envision them want to, wanting to do that anyway. Yeah, I mean, that's, right? <laughs> so, I think, you know, I think this is a very good document to start. We didn't have it, yep. and, and so I think we should embrace what we have and then, you know, keep it as a, you know, something that we can continually look at and change it. Yeah. There was one other thing, yeah. um, and it's a little tweak. Um, I really appreciated Ms. Webb introducing the mission statement at the beginning of our meetings. Um, and I was wondering if we could be a little more broad than that because there's also a vision statement that's really important to our Reading Public Schools. There are also goals that are really important. And I was thinking that if we started with something, um, something about our goals and mission rather than just the mission statement. It's um, under agendas, and it's the second bullet down. 
so that we're, we're paying attention to what our overall mission is, but there are different approaches to that. So we could, are you proposing we change that from beginning meetings with the reading of the Reading Public Schools mission statement to focus uh, all of our discussions and deliberations? It would be uh, Reading Public Schools mission, vision, or goals to focus our discussions and deliberations? I'm, I'm fine with that. So the change is instead of just mission, mission statement to cross out the word statement and say mission, vision, or goals. So that it gives the chair who opens the meeting actually a little bit more flexibility to decide how they want to start that out. Yes, thank you. Or not read anything at all. You, you can just say our goal tonight. <laughs> That's what I was laughing about. <laughs> like, we didn't do that. Because <laughs> we haven't signed off on the protocol yet. Good point. So, I don't know. I That's sort of Linda's you. friendly amendment would be to strike the word statement and put mission, comma, vision, or goals. And I don't know if there's another comma after vision and before or. Linda, did you get all that? I've got it too in the copy there. Yes. Can I make a friendly amendment that we add the word district before goals? So Reading mm -hmm. Public Schools mission, comma, vision, comma, or district goals. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Right, to focus. Just to be clear which okay. goals we should be focused on. Yeah. Right, so it sounds like there is a, amend, a friendly amendment on the table. I'll second. So back in the, uh, in the other room before we started meeting up here. Yeah. Pat, actually, Pat Scatini put the vision on the wall because I told him I wasn't going to waste oh, five yeah, yeah. minutes reading that. <laughs> so. Well, maybe we can have that, too. Kind of, it would be nice if it I was visual. It. That's a nice yeah. idea, actually. So. Yes, Mr. Boylan. <laughs> I'm just being you know, All right, so two quick points on Nick Boylan. Estate lane. Um, as long as you're in their spirit of friendly amendments under the last bullet points under roll, I think it should say staying because before that it says buy. Right now it says buy stay. Where, is Where are you? So if you look at under roll, the school committee will work toward continuous improvement in teaching and learning by colon. Then the bullet points, they're all gerunds. You're Not gerunding. It. It. So it should say staying. I can't make a friendly amendment, but you can. I'll make the friendly amendment that Thank we you, add sir. ING to the end of stay. I will second the right. friendly Jaron amendment. And if you want, I'll read the Reading Public School mission for you since that's under agendas. <laughs> the mission of the Reading Public Schools is to strive to ensure that all students have a common, challenging, meaningful learning experiences in the academics, health, and wellness, the arts, community, service, co curricular activities, and athletics. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Two amendments. Yep. Two amendments. I'll second Tom's second one, but I did. Oh, she did. Okay. <laughs> we need to vote on them to accept them before we accept the whole thing. No, yeah. we can. No, we can uh, ex oh, ex vote on the uh, finalized as amended version. Okay. I'm comfortable with one John vote. The two friendly amendments. John has a question. Yes, John. Um, Underneath school committee operating protocols, um, we've got follows Robert's rules of order. I don't know if anybody's ever truly seen Robert's rules of order, <laughs> but there is a volume about this thick. Do we need to change that as a friendly amendment to the town's accepted rules of order? Well, well first of all, the town, I think town meeting goes by town meeting time. It's not Robert's rules. Yeah. And the way we conduct these meetings, I mean, for the most part, you know, we follow Robert's rules in the way we vote, in the way we... But it's not the motions. full book. No. But... Uh, or even a modified Robert's rules. Because if we start following Robert's rules and it's here, mm -hmm. it's extensive. But it's extensive when, when those particular 
things come up in a meeting. With the things that generally come up in our meetings, we do follow Robert's rules of order with uh, the way we do the agenda and the voting and stuff. So yeah. I don't know that, I don't think it's that. It's Are you that, concerned that that boxes us in somehow? It may box us in somehow. Yeah. Yes. I guess I'm comfortable with it um, because I know what you're saying, that, that the form of Robert's rules that we follow is some basic stuff, motion, second, yeah. friendly amendments. Yeah. We use Robert's rules, but not every single little detail. But I guess in the event that a procedural question came up and it was unclear what Robert's rule was, I would assume the chair would take a recess, do the research to come back and say, you know, somebody has done something we've never done on this committee before. We're going to take a five-minute recess. I'm going to do some research to figure out what Robert's rule says. How we, so I, I think that's the safety valve. That, yeah. that, I don't know, but I think that's how we would handle it. That's fine. But I'd be, I, I guess I would be afraid to do a modified Robert's Rules because that's vague. Yeah. So then the question is, how do you, how do you modify it? Right, right. There's At no least now, thing. right, exactly. Uh, so that's off? Okay. I have one question as well. Yes. Um, and I, first of all, knowing that the protocol is not policy, policy supersedes protocol, law supersedes policy, which supersedes protocol. Right. Um, the protocol says, under no circumstances in information requests, that's the section I'm in, under no circumstances should a committee member ask staff members for information or action without going through the superintendent chair. Now, this section is intended to focus on information for our meetings and things along those lines, but technically is in violation with our communication with staff protocol in that we as parents still can ask staff for information. It's a different right? path. Hmm? It should say in their role, right? Yeah. Yep. Committee member, in their role as a school committee member. Yes. I'm, I'm okay with that amendment as well, but I just wanted to. A committee member. To, in yeah, it's a different role. hat too. In the capacity. Parent versus. In their capacity as a school, yeah, but you know, maybe our English. Uh, <laughs> I'm struggling, I'm thinking in my head right can now. help us figure out the right way to look at that, but you know, technically if we were to look at the policy in question, it's super schools, committee staff, okay. policy GBD is the one that says we can, as parents, still talk to our teachers and all that kind of fun right, stuff. A committee member acting in that capacity. I don't know, should a committee member acting in that capacity yes, ask staff members for information? Does that do it? I don't know. Gene, Under no circumstances should a committee work? member acting in their capacity I'm still thinking. as a member ask in staff. Their, yeah, in their school committee capacity. What that? Committee Palma member. acting in their capacity as a member, ask staff. Mm -hmm. So Jean, that, what that reads as, just, and you can come look at it if you want to. Um, there's two commas there. The acting in their capacity as a member is in between the commas, and then ask staff is where it continues. About those two commas. Huh? I'm not, that's why I'm asking the question because <laughs> I'm not a comma guy. Listen to a Malcolm Gladwell piece on commas for 45 minutes, and I will never attempt again to figure it out. But I don't know, circumstances should a committee member, I think there should only be one comma because you don't want to, because you want it has to be integral to the sentence. Yep. So, um, when I'm actually, I'm less focused on the grammar, although I have thoughts on that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm wondering, and I'm thinking out loud because I didn't have time to process it ahead, would it be better to make a specific carve out as a parent guardian? Instead of saying in your capacity as a school committee member, is it better to say you should never do this, you under no circumstances give up your right as a parent? Um, I'm trying to figure out if acting in their capacity as a school committee member makes that clear. Mm -hmm. That's what the policy actually does is make a carve out for parents. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking, that it <clears throat> almost might be better to be explicit or that we, this is the exception. Because yeah. I'm a little bit worried that acting in their capacity as a school committee member, mm -hmm. I read that and go, well, of course you are. This is the school committee member operating protocol. That mm -hmm. So what, if what we're really trying to do is say you don't give up. Yeah, I would almost right. want to steal the, the language from the policy. From the policy Do you have it, Mr. Says, Rice? Note, nothing in the above policy is meant to limit or replace a member's access to the school to which his or her children attends. In such case, the member shall enjoy all rights and privileges as a parent of a child who attends the school. 
What if we just make it? Or we can just refer to the policy. Or how yeah. about yeah. under no? Uh, how cap, about under? I think I like how about that. how about saying what what I think it's meant to mean and what what we're kind of dancing around here? It's under no circumstances should a committee member use their influence, or should under no circumstances should a school committee use their influence as to ask staff members for information or action without something along those lines. Without going to the superintendent. I think that's what the point of whoever wrote that was right. trying to say, right? I, th I, I, I think we might, though, accomplish something by just saying the Refer to members' the rights um, as parents as are protected are, are protected in policy, whatever yeah. this is. I, I actually like that. Just m members' rights as parents of Reading Public School students, parents' guardians are protected as identified under policy, whatever policy that is. And what's nice about that is if in the event that we change the policy, the operating protocol yeah. doesn't have to be changed. It's down. Yeah, no, it's, it's the policy. It's GBD. Thank you. As, as an umbrella way to cover what you're trying to do, and it was occurring to me what I've seen in, in other policies you have off the top of my head, I can't. You could have a carve out as a prefix, except as otherwise permitted permitted by law and policy, and then lead right into this. Because that maybe there's another case that exists that you're not thinking of that would be excluded by the under no circumstance. And when you're talking about influence, well, what does influence mean? Yeah, it's it's speaking, but by saying except as otherwise provided by law and policies, you could even say including but not limited to policy. GEB or something to make sure everyone knows that. But then you're giving yourself whatever the law allows you because there may be circumstances that you have to speak to them. Okay. So just just a thought. Is there a friendly amendment on the on the committee to do that amendment if she agrees? <laughs> I actually really like that solution. I think it's broad enough to cover us, but I think the point that the, the protocol should explicitly say that that's I think that's a good solution. So how would you word that then? That's at the beginning of the paragraph is your suggestion, right. Mrs. Downing, right? Yes. Except as otherwise provided by law and policies. Yeah. Including but not limited to policy, GEB, whatever this is. Okay. Yeah. GBD. GBD. And would this be after the sentence? Under no circumstances, blah, 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 except uh, as otherwise. Or we already yeah. Can you can read it or follow it. I don't think we should delete the statement, but. Oh, definitely not. Except. Delete what statement? Here's how it reads now then. Okay. Um, except as otherwise provided by law and policy, comma, including policy GBD, comma, under no circumstances should a committee member ask staff members for information or action without going through the superintendent and chair. Hmm? Sounds good. So that was friendly amendment. a friendly amendment as well. I'm yep. So I'll strike that member's rights portion, right? Yeah. Did. No, read it again. Just the as, motion. As a, as amended. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Move to accept the revised school committee operating protocols as amended. That's probably <laughs> Thank you. Second. Other concerns over there? No. All those in favor? No. Six, six. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we were going to do the uh, capital, the capital update. Sorry, Joe. I <laughs> saw you sitting back there for a while. So typically at this meeting, what we do is um, ask so Joe Huggins, director of facilities, to come and give us a quick update to close out the capital from the prior year and talk about the capital projects for the upcoming year. And just a couple of quick comments that I wanted to make Thank as you. part of this. As um, Mr. Wise mentioned, the September 18th financial forum has been canceled due to the lack of quorum. They, are res they have rescheduled parts of what we're going to be covered at the September 18th meeting to the September 11th 
Finance Committee meeting where they will be giving a preview of some of the items coming up for next year's budget capital items. So we are asking that a member of school committee attend that meeting as well and if there would be a quorum if we could just know so that we could post that. It's Wednesday, September 11th. It's the day before our next meeting. It's a busy week. I'm the liaison. I'll be there. Okay. Thank you. Would it be, yeah. could we just post the school committee that way if there's a quorum we're covered? Yeah. It might just be the safer yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Absolutely. And the other item that we wanted to mention as well is that um, it'll be part of the updates we're giving, but the Permanent Building Committee has been doing um, a, a facilities assessment and they have completed their assessment of the schools. We have invited the chair of the PBC to attend our meeting on September 12th where he will be giving a preview of that report which will then be presented at, I believe it's the October 18th financial forum as well as town meeting. So we did want people to know that um, Pat Thompson will be attending the September 12th school committee meeting. I believe it's the October 16th. 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 16th, yeah. Wednesday. Hopefully we're not meeting on a Friday, but I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no place I'd rather be on a Friday night. <laughs> so at this point, I will turn it over um, to Joe to give an update on the FY19 capital FY20 preview, as well as we do have some quick updates on the three capital projects that are sort of continuing, 19 to 20. Thank you. So for FY19, we had some, on the school side for capital, we completed uh, some carpet work, which was actually replacing landings at the Parker Middle School. That was done in FY19. We also did um, some carpeting work here at Reading Memorial High School, the auditorium, the media center, and walk-off mats throughout the building. We also did a, a hot water boiler replacement at the Coolidge Middle School. and. The high school, we are replacing one of the Cleaver Brooks boilers, which we carried that money over into this fiscal year. We're, we're about 90% complete with that, and we're going to be starting that, the new boilers up on, on or about September 5th uh, with a factory startup scheduled. The uh, security project, which is, um, is in the design phase right now, we're continuing to work with uh, the town manager and the, the working group, as well as the design team. Um, and putting together a scope of work for that particular project. Um, in addition, one of the things that came up within the, as part of the security work, we uh, security uh, assessment we did was to look at how we were how our key buildings were keyed and how what good how good a control we had over keys in, within our buildings. So we launched the. Um, uh, what we call a key matrix here at the high school that gives you an eligibility level for who can and cannot have a key, which took us about a year and a half to do that. We've extended that into two schools. We, we re-keyed the exterior of the Birch Meadow over the summer as well as the Killam, and we plan to do the rest of the schools uh, within the month of September to get better control of access to the exterior of the buildings where you're most vulnerable. So we're working on that project too, which was a sort of low-hanging fruit from the security uh, assessment that we did. The next big um, project we've been working on, everybody's probably noticed that they've been driving in, uh, Turf 2 um, construction began on August 12th. Um, Quirk Construction from Georgetown, Mass. is the general contractor. Um, they've done a great deal of um, athletic uh, turf field services um, in Melrose, Neshoba Valley, Clark University, Newton South, Mansfield High School and UMass Lowell. So these, these folks are really uh, highly experienced in this in this field. Um, we've been having bi-weekly construction meetings uh, with all the stakeholders, including recreation and the athletic director, and, uh, Gail and myself, and engineering. I think we've told everybody before that this is uh, kind of a unique setup where it's a school field. Um, the project is being run in conjunction with uh, engineering division for the town as well as facilities in the school department. 
they are reviewing all submittals and doing daily site visits with myself. So we're out there quite a bit, but engineering is doing a lot of the uh, heavy lifting, making sure that things are going in and coming, moving along as they should be. Over the next, over the last few weeks, we've done, um, they installed erosion control around the entire uh, field, removed the old fencing from uh, turf two, um, demoed the turf field itself and took that away strip back the loam, which is now going to be turf around the, around the whole footprint of turf two. Um, they did some subgrade work. The lights were demoed the other day. The poles are probably going to be coming down tomorrow or Monday. And they started installing the concrete nailer, which the turf, um, the carpet, they call it, will be actually attached to. Over the next few weeks, uh, they're going to continue installing the concrete nailer, pouring the form for that and installing it. Uh, they're putting new sleeves in for the fencing. The fencing is, uh, in a lot of areas, over six feet high, so it requires uh, a sleeve to be installed into the ground and anchored. So they're going to be installing those ahead of the turf going in place. Uh, they're, they tested how well the field drained to make sure there were no issues. Uh, and the good news is that um, we've never had an issue with turf two with the drainage issue, so, but they did confirm that. and. They're going to be doing some base work to the existing. Um, uh, they've removed all the pellets or the infill, and they're going to be working on the uh, the base of the of turf two and extending that out. And if if you've noticed, there's white bags piled probably halfway down towards the where the porta potties are. They actually are re uh, reusing a lot of that material and adding where necessary. So we're saving a lot of that and reusing it. So the project is moving along pretty well. They were hoping to be done somewhere around the end of October. Um, I think that's a safe bet, unless weather is the biggest thing this time of year for them. That could that would be the biggest slowdown. So for the enrollment study, we did expand the actual enrollment piece to cover K through 12 based upon discussions we had with the committee to make sure we're looking not just at one pocket of it, but to make sure we're looking at everything. We have continued to work with GNAP to evaluate based upon the enrollment and the programmatic needs to look at various scenarios. So we have continued to work on that throughout the summer and we will be updating the committee during the fall as we have more information to provide. So that project is still progressing. You said K through 12, not pre-K through 12. Are we sticking to K through 12? Uh, pre-K through 12. Oh, okay. pre, uh, the pre-K piece is a little bit tougher because you don't exactly have the actual enrollment numbers yeah. because that's, but we are <laughs> looking at the pre-K space as a project. And I think the only one piece I wanted to add to the security piece is that working with the town manager, we have submitted a request to the Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety and Security for a $75,000 earmark that would go towards the security project specifically related to security enhancements at the high school. So that would be part of the overall project. It wouldn't be additive to it, but it would be another source of funding for it. So we, are, we have we submitted the request this week, and once we hear back, we will let the committee know. Any questions on 19? So for FY20 uh, capital coming up, we have money in the capital plan um, to replace some um, split systems over at the Barrows um, Elementary School. Um, Joshua Eaton, same thing. We have money in the, in the capital plan to address that. Um, and a lot of this that you're seeing is um, stuff that we saw when we were doing the walkthroughs for the security study um, to provide cooling in a lot of these head-end rooms that don't have cooling or replace cooling that is at the end of its useful life. So just keep that in mind. You're gonna see that coming up. We've got money in the capital plan for some door work over at Killam, which we are continuing to maintain that building. And if we see things that need to get done, we're doing it. Um, wood end, we have money in the uh, capital plan for HVAC improvements, including exhaust fans and some energy management um, tie-ins. And we're also, we've also procured a, uh, a new vehicle for the courier, which should be in any time now. Which we have the old driver's ed car that we repurposed, which has been on the road now for over 10 years. So um, that's pretty much a snapshot of the capital. 
So we did want to let the committee know that as we prepare for the upcoming financial forums, we have started to meet with the town manager, myself, the facilities department, and we, depending upon funding as we work through where we currently are, we might be, um, through Joe's team, requesting some additional funds to add cooling and replace cooling in the head-in rooms at some of the schools that we have not currently done and that are not currently part of the FY20 capital plan, but we will keep the committee updated as we move forward with that. And a lot of this will be discussed in the September and October financial forums. This is typically the time of year we start to look at the capital project for the current year and the outlying years and make any adjustments as necessary. And I thought what might make sense, um, since we made Joe wait, that it, unless there were questions on the capital plan, the next we were going to go into the summer update, which they sort of, a lot of it melds together. Um, we've One question. Yep. I don't, I mean, we haven't met since July, and at that point yeah. you were going out for the bid, and you were happy with some of the bids, and they were under, I'm talking about Turf 2 in particular, yep. they were under budget, mm -hmm. but I don't think we actually ever heard. And we, how much can you share on that front? We, at this point, cannot share a lot. We actually are waiting there um, in case there are any change orders or any items that come up. So once we are closer to completion, we'll be able to report out where we are because at this point, if there are any change orders, we don't want to commit to a number and then have to go back on, on it. But we will be, um, we should be able to present that, I would say, mid to end October. October. Before you jump into the summer update, I know it's been uh, said a few times tonight, and I would like to say I, I agree with and reiterate the comments. And you know, we were in a lot of communication throughout the summer, but I really do appreciate all the hard work and, and uh, everything that was done, and you know, the positive. Po po positive approach that you took to it, so thank you. So we will, um, one of the items as we go into the summer repair list, update list, um, we do, I do want, I do have to thank the facilities group because I will say the buildings mm. all look fantastic. We spent two days last week doing walkthroughs of all of the buildings, met with all of the building principals, um, everything. I don't know how it happens every year, but magically everything comes together and the buildings all look amazing. And one of the items we did want to let the committee know, as we were going through the budget process, we did mention that our outsourced cleaning contract was up for renewal. That did go out. Um, we are very happy to report that Complete Cleaning, who is our current cleaning company, was actually um, the low bidder on the contract and we are very excited that we were able to re-award the contract to them so we are continuing with the same cleaning contract um, and we did very well it we were we weren't sure where it was going to come in but we were able to settle the contract within the budgeted figures so we we're also very happy that that we got very favorable pricing for three years and it is very helpful for us to be able to keep the same cleaning yeah. Mm -hmm. company in here and they've done a fabulous job with that so we did yeah. want to let the committee know that that has been closed out and we will be keeping the same service provider so with that I'll turn it over okay so um, every most everybody around the table knows how how the facilities department is structured but we have um, two divisions three divisions within facilities it's the core facilities group, which it maintains all the buildings and all the utilities and the infrastructure of the buildings. Um, we have the town buildings that we also maintain, which is more or less just custodial and cleaning contracts that's managed by us also. And then we have the school facilities, which is school custodians, which is around 23 people, 18 full-time, and then some substitutes that's managed by Kevin Gerstner. He's our facilities manager who really make the ma makes the magic happen in the summer with, the, with the, the staff because we have a lot of people who have, as you can imagine, there's a lot of people who want to take vacation mm -hmm. and the buildings are in full <laughs> use in the summertime. So to pull it off and get it done for the opening day, it requires a lot of teamwork. So we're, we're very fortunate. We have Kevin Kabuzi, who's our assistant director. Um, it's a good team of people down there that do, you know work very well. Um, I'm not going to bore you with all the details because my list is long, but um, 
at every school got work done at it this summer in addition to the generated list that the principals put in every June May June we um, develop our own list so the repair lists that were generated by the principals were all completed with life safety at the top of the list and then everything else fell in below that and we the last few weeks was when we really step on it to get everything done but oh, above and beyond that we did uh, some other project work like over at Barrows we did some masonry work on the foundation over there installed some new bottle fill stations which were donated by the PTO uh, we did masonry work at Birch Meadow on the loading dock as well as some of the bulkheads we did switch gear testing at Killam and Joshua Eaton. Um, this was one of the things that the Permanent Building Committee and, um, and our group decided would be very important to launch a PM on, which we were not doing. And we, believe it or not, Killam did very well, considering it's the oldest school that's never been renovated. Um, at Eaton, we took a project in-house. We replaced around 400 feet of fascia and soffit board around that building, that was done, which is done by our two carpenters, which came out really nice. We did some stair work over there. If you happen to go into the building, both front sets of stairs, front sets of stairs have been rebuilt, um, and we repointed the um, the brick on the Oak Street side of the building. That was all done this summer. Coolidge Middle School, we installed a new freezer. We worked with food services on that. They were able to pay for it, procure it, and we installed a brand new freezer over there. The physical freezer itself is original, but what I'm talking about the condensing unit and the evaporator are brand new. We, we facilitated that over there. Uh, we refinished the uh, gym floor over at Parker and did a, um, some work in the kitchen. Um, the field house um, roof here at the Reading Memorial High School, we did an overlay about 4,000 square feet uh, of, um, of roof. We took up and put a new uh, section in there. We were having some issues with leaks over the court. That was done this summer. We also reskinned the top of the stage. If you go onto the auditorium stage, you'll see that there's a new surface that's put down to protect the floor, which was getting beaten up from the amount of, just the general amount of use that we have up here. Um, all buildings in town received the normal preventive maintenance um, on all the rooftop equipment and all the boilers, all the, any mechanical equipment got touched this summer and, and was worked on. We also added something new, which is, um, perform preventive maintenance on our gym divider curtains, backboards, and bleachers, which we were not doing in the past. We always have a company come in, but we decided we'd make the uh, commitment and get it done every year and have actually somebody come out and physically inspect everything so it happens every summer. The fire department and the building inspector did their walkthroughs of all eight schools and generated a list, and they, they always do, which is normal. They uh, generate a list of uh, sort of action items, we'll call it, that we they'd like to see get done. It's it's some, a lot of it's housekeeping, just because storage is at a ver is at a premium in schools. But we successfully got through that and had an action list, and we took care of that. Um, we performed, like I said, the the grease traps, the fire alarms, the fire sprinklers, the suppression systems, the emergency lighting, generators, elevators, were all taken care of. Eye wash and fume hood inspections at all the schools. Um, we disposed of all the school committee approved surplus furniture this summer, got rid of all that. Just to replace it with more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Public Works Department now is responsible for maintaining and um, repairing flat work outside the buildings. Facilities owns everything from the staircase in, but the flat work, the sidewalks and the curbing and, the, and is, is something that was kind of a gray area. And they're now doing that first and they did a lot of work at multiple locations over the summer. And as, as I mentioned, Kevin's team cleaned all the school buildings, and we did a lot of internal moves um, in, within the schools, from school to school, if there was a program that might have changed, or within teachers changing rooms, things like that. So that was pretty much it. I mean, I... Can you can. My other hat. We've also been working... Um, is why he's not allowed to leave yet in case I say it wrong. We, we work very closely with DPW um, in the water department to do their annual testing. We're actually very happy to report that the last of the schools were tested this summer. We spent, we being the water department, um, the town plumber, spent a lot of time going through all of the buildings, identifying, mapping, tagging, all 
of the sources of water coming into the buildings. Um, so this year we had Parker and RMHS were the ones that were tested. There is an open letter that we have included in the school committee packet. It is also in um, posted on the town's website as well. The results were very good. We we had, which is not surprising. We this has happened at all the buildings where we have had items that did test high at the high school. We found two high lead levels um, at Parker. We found three. They were. We did remediation, we did testing on them. Um, at the end of the day, we were able to mitigate the majority of it. There were two remaining high level lead sinks um, that have been clearly identified. One is at RMHS and one is at the high school. These are not used for um, food prep items or primary water sources. So we have gone in and labeled items that are, cannot be used for drinking water that are um, hand wash sinks only. And as part of our annual process when we're opening the schools, I met with all of the food services personnel to remind them of the flush process for any water that is being used for preparatory purposes in any of the kitchens that have not been identified that they flush for 30 seconds. Um, and then there was one sink at Parker in the nurse's office that is now hand wash only, but there are other water sources. So to the extent they're giving medication and whatnot, there, there is water sources for that. So we were very pleased with the results and I do have to say it was amazing watching all of the teams come together, do the testing, do all the tagging and do all the remediation. Um, and I did want to let folks know, I just saw it before coming up here, that there was an article in the Chronicle that I can send the link around as well. We met with the reporter and um, with Eric from the Water Department and they interviewed us. It's a very nice article that goes through all of the work that we do on an annual basis to ensure that we have safe drinking water. So that was another big accomplishment that we got done over the summer. Yeah. Thank you. I have oh, a yeah. question. Um, I'm going back a little, mm -hmm. back to the surplus materials. Yep. Um, first of all, though, I've seen what you guys have been doing in the schools, and it's amazing. Thank you so much, for, despite the heat and everything else. Thank you so much for what you've gotten done. They look fabulous. Um, my question is about being proactive about the surplus equipment. I know that sometimes the surplus equipment gathers in places that otherwise would be used by students and I'm just wondering if there's a plan like where is is there a place that it can go that isn't student use or is it um, can it be moved before it accumulates it, this is I question. can tell you that over the last probably five years the schools have um, gotten much better about where they store uh, items so that when the fire department does come through, and I'm, and I'm talking from a safety standpoint, that they're not um, finding things that are stuck in stairwells and stuck in electrical rooms. We're always gonna have things placed in areas that we would not like to have them placed, but um, the principals do a really good job at making use of their space. I could name a couple of schools this summer that actually you know, reorganized storage rooms to make more space in other areas for what you're talking about. So it's, there's not a lot out there, but you're dealing with a million square feet, so you're always gonna have turnover and stuff like that, so. I was gonna say one of the other items that we're doing is we went through and did the surplus list at the end of the year last year. I will say that now that the summer is over and we've done all of the cleaning, we've gone through the fire inspection, we are pulling together a list of items that came up over the summer, whether it be the technology that we've replaced that we're either not able to repair, refurbish, um, any of the furniture that's been deemed needs to be thrown or, I don't say thrown away, just disposed of. Discarded. So we are going to be coming to school committee in the fall to go through another list. That way that'll allow us to get that out as well we have been attempting to consolidate it and come to the school committee once a year but looking at what we have we're shifting that practice as well to come more frequently during the year so that we don't have that occur awesome thank you thank you 
So I think a couple of other um, updates that I wanted to give um, as well. And thank you, Mrs. Downing, for the kind you. words with thank the transportation. Um, we did want to let people know that the first two days of school, we have been monitoring the traffic at all of our locations. I know predominantly we have been monitoring it at the high school, but I will say I, I learned more about the streets of Reading in the past two days than I had known before. Um, so after um, the first day of school, myself, the principal, Kate Boynton, um, Dave Clark, Christine Amendola, the two SROs, we met in Kate's office to review how the first day of drop-off went. And I think, as everybody knows, the first day does tend to probably be the most difficult because that's where you have everybody coming. You've got parents, you have grandparents, you have pictures, you have the first day is always tends to be a little bit more congested as everybody gets used to what is happening. We did meet and discuss how it went. Based upon those discussions, we did decide to make a few adjustments to the drop-off schedule in the morning. We had a couple of additional signs added showing people where drop-offs could be. We opened up another drop-off pattern, so rather than just having one avenue for parents to drop children off, we actually opened up a second. We monitored it again today. Today's went much better I think there is that 10 to 15 minute window mm -hmm. where there is a lot of traffic but I will say I do have to thank everyone that was involved with it we ended up I think on Tuesday having or Wednesday Monday Wednesday okay. having at the end have I believe there were four police officers that were here helping to direct traffic so as we were monitoring it we increased the number of people that we had out there I do also want to acknowledge that at Birch Meadow in Killam, we actually did add an additional crossing guard at each location because we had heard that there were concerns about some of the crossings there. So working with the police department over the summer, we looked at it, we reviewed it. Um, so each location does have an additional crossing guard. We will be continuing to monitor it into next week because we realize sometimes traffic patterns sort of work themselves out as people get more used to it, but we will continue to meet through next week to see what, if any, other adjustments need to be made. We're also monitoring the bus schedules and bus times again the first two days. What we did not want to do was adjust the bus schedule and bus times every single day because we felt that would add more yeah. angst to people. So we are going to reassess it throughout the week next week and any adjustments that we need to make, we would make and communicate it out. And I worked very closely with DPW. I'm now part of their distribution list. So mm -hmm. I've had, um, so part of the tricky part is they do have a lot of information that goes out through Code Red, um, but those tend to go out to the citizens in the impacted areas, not necessarily town-wide. So I am now getting those notifications. Um, we met this morning to talk about some of the updates. They have our bus routes, so based upon a lot of the communication over the past couple of days, we're now almost in daily communication as some of these items come up. Un unfortunately, construction is going to happen. We're going to make adjustments as best we can and communicate it a as we can. So we um, will continue to have those meetings with individuals. So um, one of the things I think that's impacted, and perhaps you, you've been talking with Dave Clark about it, is. Um, students who are riding bicycles. And so as we have, you know, construction on the roads and you've got, um, you know, drains that, cars are busy trying to avoid, you know, drains that are now potholes and there's construction in the road and then you're driving east and the kids are coming right at you. So I, I just wish that this happened last year too, that the, maybe the police department could just put something out to the community, you know, uh, reminding, um, you know, what is the safe way, safe direction to ride for these, these students and, you know, making sure that they have their helmets on and that the parents are just talking to them about safely riding those bikes to school. Um, I just, I, and maybe that's already happened. Um, I drive Wakefield Street every morning and it's just, this is a recipe for, um, for that because it they're, they're doing construction and it's narrow and no sidewalks and sun in your eyes and so uh, just if, if something can go out talk to him 
Thank you. Yes. The, the person that called the police department said that they didn't come home on the bus. Did that just turn out to be unfounded? Yesterday. Oh, that was yesterday. So we are working through that with our um, transportation. I don't know if you want how much we can get into. I don't know how much we can get into. No. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was an a, an incident. I've been working very closely with the bus company. I've been in contact with the parents. All of the students are safe. Were safe through through the entire time. Um, they did come home. They were just yes. Late. They, they were, were late. They very late. late. They, yes. They, made, <laughs> they were late. Yes. They weren't lost. Yeah. That that's still uh, being investigated. But everybody's safe. Get to the bottom of it. And the families involved were contacted. Yes. yes. Just so you know. Okay. I have yes. one question. Um, so, Ms. Dowd, uh, some parents have started a online thing called Raise the Gate. <laughs> um, the, the gate on the backside of uh, RMHS. I don't know if you've heard anything on that front, if you've considered it, if it's untouchable or if we can help in some way, shape, or form, um, if necessary, um, and if you believe that would help with the traffic around RMHS and Birch Meadow in particular. That is one of the items we are looking into. I have had discussions with that. I don't know all of the ins and outs, any legal questions, concerns, the roadway. Um, we did, that did come up yesterday and today when we were having our meetings to see what we can do and that is being talked about and looked into. And as I have more information, we will let people know. I'm actually learning, I'm, I'm, I wanna make sure I have all of the information and facts as to the history behind all of it to make sure we're making all the right decisions. So we are having, um, we did have discussions about that this morning. We're now reaching out to other individuals that might be able to assist us. And Mrs. Webb yeah. and Mr. Well, Robinson might have more information well, on Well, I, I think Mr. Robinson and I were uh, on the committee when the gate first closed. And um, so it, it's been a longstanding issue, I think. Of course, I'm sure Chief Cormier is one of the people that you reach out to because he probably has the most history. But I think it's really important because I've I, you know, been under the impression that when we sort of looked at this late start that we would be looking at a comprehensive traffic study and that that would be part of it. So I think it is important that this work continue. I fully understand that there's a lot of history and a lot of moving parts, but I think the most important thing is to me is the safety of the students in that parking lot as you have people mm -hmm. parking, cars driving through, and students walking and, te and te teachers or staff walking to get into the building. And that has, that's been, I think, the longstanding issue with that, that if that gate was open, you would cut the traffic back through that parking lot in half, increase the safety of the people walking by 50%. You know, so. I, yeah, I think that you know, this is meant to be an update. Yes. The, the professionals, the police are looking yep. at it yep. and we'll you know, let them. Yeah, I don't have a definitive answer answers. tonight. I can say that we had a very long discussion about it today and we are looking into what, if any, options are available. Well, if we can be help for any of us, so I'll say, if I can be help, I'll be happy to help. Thank you. Yes. This is just for, just for Gail. If you want to tell Ray Miares if he's looking at, or I don't know who the outside counsel is, I was on, looking on the Registry of deed site online for all the abutting land, and I believe it's like April 29th, 1990, your predecessor school committee, gave an easement to the house that's being built there to access their house across our driveway. But that easement retained a whole bunch of rights of the school committee to repurpose that at any time for any use. So there may be private agreements, but in terms of the land, and you'll have to trace through, but I just wanted to give you that 1990 marker. Go look in there in the deeds, April 1990, and you'll see that we, have a, we still have a lot of rights, if that's still good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Jan, did you want to? Sure. Um, 
I have had a very busy um, summer, and I am very, very grateful to the team at Central Office. They've made a wonderful transition for me in, and I felt very welcome and supported. Uh, the summer program, which is um, overseen by the Special Education Administrator, Allison Wright, um, was very successful. Um, I walked through many, many days um, and had the opportunity to observe in some amazing lessons and then I tried <laughs> to um, reach out and call as many parents as I could after I had met their children um, to have conversations and just introduce myself. Um, throughout the process, not only of summer school, but just getting to know the building-based leaders and meeting with students, families, and community members. Um, I've been able to refine my entry plan a little bit more, and um, I've reached out to the CPAC, and I would really like um, to start with them and have them do some of the outreach, because I do think a lot of the work we're going to be doing is aligning systems and bringing people together in terms of communication and and sharing all the great work and i want to make sure their voice is heard um, so as soon as we do that step um, i'll be reaching back out to all of you um, and we're really trying to just make sure that we're really clear and concise in our uh, communications i know the seas pack is looking at creating a flyer with all of their dates that we'll be able to give out to parents at meetings and really start to build that sense of um, positive community where people can be heard and um, ideas brought forward. Um, and all of that, those pieces will be in the entry plan as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so we, as Jen mentioned, we've had a busy summer. First of all, I, I just want to say, I didn't want to interrupt um, Joe and Gail, but just a tremendous job by uh, everything that they oversee with getting our buildings ready. Um, again, Jen and I, Jen Stiles and I were talking, we've worked in other districts and we're just amazed at how awesome the buildings look. I think um, folks in Reading don't even realize that not all schools everywhere look like this and especially some of our older buildings where I had an old house for many years and it's really hard to make an older building look shiny and beautiful and they do it and they do it actually really cheerfully so I just want to say uh, on behalf of all of us and the kids that come in it's just amazing um, you know echoing the the gratefulness of, of the board and, and folks who are recognizing our hard work, I appreciate that. We have really worked hard this summer, um, but especially a huge shout out um, to our building principals who, you know, in the midst of us really managing district-wide efforts, they just do their jobs and they do them really well. So, you know, they we're here, they check with us, but honestly, they are really uh, true experts and, and they know what they're doing and we, um, the three of us were able to get to every building, uh, either some of us or all of us, depending on other things we were dealing with, competing interests in the last two days, um, and really just beautiful entry, really. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is we had our welcoming in, um, message on uh, for the staff this week, which I know some of you were able to attend, but for those in the audience or at home that weren't able to attend, it was really lovely. Um, Jennifer did a wonderful, uh, welcoming, touching moment speech, I think, on labels that don't matter and talked a lot about her personal journey. And it was just, it was very approachable. It, the, the staff, it really resonated with the staff. So uh, it was wonderful. Um, and our new um, MedCo director talked about cultural lens and, and his vision for that. And it was really, uh, I think he's gonna make such a wonderful addition here. Um, and I welcome folks back. I know Gail did a nice job of emceeing the whole event and welcoming everyone. Um, I ended up talking about uh, my, one of my favorite movies, The Greatest Showman, and really talking about this is the greatest show. Our, our work really is. I mean, we're, it, education it has its challenges. We all know that. Um, but it really is the greatest show. We, we make such a difference. And um, my, I can't, I, I sat down yesterday to do it and I, I'm not good at math. Gail has to help me with that. Um, I don't know if this is my 33rd or 34th year, math but yeah, <laughs> I think it's my 34th year. Um, but it's just every year is magical and the first day of school is just so amazing. So how awesome are we that we get to do that? 
So going through that, um, we had induction for our 35 professional staff. It was four days. It was really awesome. You saw some of the people here. You heard their resumes. I mean, amazing. And just the energy in the room. Um, Linda mentioned about our professional development. As I told you earlier this summer, we did the Reading Institute this summer in June. We had five courses then, about 80 some odd people. We ran one of our courses again in August. It was so well received. We had to have two sessions. Um, and it was on really cultural proficiency and really looking at that lens on equity. That is going to now become a course that every new professional staff member will take in their first three years of uh, working in Reading. And it, it's taught by our own Karen Hall, which is an um, EL teacher. She works with our English language department, but she's really talented um, with all really cultural proficiencies. And I know Jen's going to be working with her to sort of tweak it, and uh, Grant will be working with her as well. So we're really going to be um, coordinating that. In addition, our new uh, class of new um, recruits will be taking another professional development course within the first three years that will be of their own choice. Um, so we will have a menu option of some of the other ones. It could be a, a workshop model for um, elementary placement. It could be a differentiation class or an executive functioning or dealing with trauma. But we will have a menu of offerings throughout the year. But we're really telling them not to do it this year <laughs> because we want them to really take the time to work with their mentor. Mm -hmm. in year one and the only requirement we're having is, are the regular meetings with the mentor a couple of district-wide met meetings we've really upped our mentor program which I should have said when Jen was here um, Jen Styes um, Jen, Jen Styes is gonna be helping as well but Jen Bovey is uh, working with me to really up our mentor program we actually have um, mentor supporters at every at every level this year elementary middle school and high school staff as well as a building principal that are going to really help train our mentors so that we can really work with folks um, so that's exciting um, Rye starts next week so they had their orientation today and uh, we'll be making the rounds at Rise. Um, but they as you know there's two campuses now down from three uh, we will have what, two classrooms at Wood End and then everyone else is here so um, that's very exciting so as far as um, my departments, a um, couple of updates. So after school, I know there was a lot of conversations around the wait list with after school. Um, and we did some, we were able to get some folks off the wait list. As I mentioned earlier in the spring, our program has just grown. Uh, when Sandy Calandrella came on, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I think she's been here. Maybe it's longer. Longer. Yeah, nine. My ten. daughter's nine. Yeah. So, she's been here <laughs> okay. that long. so years get fuzzy for me uh, the older I get. So, um, anyway, Sandy's been here a long time. I think her program started at like about 150, 200 applicants, um, and we had over 700 this year. So, we're really um, growing um, quickly and trying to meet the needs of the community. As I said to you, all of the after school programs have wait lists. Um, they're, we're all having that growing pains uh, as far as. Reading becoming a community that want, wants and needs um, after school programming and quality after school programming. So um, currently we do have 159 people still on our wait list, which sounds like a huge number. Um, just so you know, we did a priority wait list, which is for returning folks. Um, 100 of those are from that, um, but we also have 59 people that registered after that date. So, you know, frankly, we already had used up the spots before we even opened it up beyond the priority um, time. We have been also able to get 65 people off the wait list. Mm -hmm. So our wait list was much, so you, you figure it was well over 200. Um, and we're still working on that. We're hiring like crazy, um, doing a nice job of really trying to find the best candidates. As I said to you earlier, the economy continues to not be our friend. Um, I was listening to a talk radio the other day, and they were saying that uh, preschools are really struggling with getting employees, too. So I think it's part of our industry. Um, but I know Sandy continues to uh, interview and, and hire. Um, so one of the other avenues to, to jump in with turn over to Gail. that I've been working with um, Sandy and her team, as well as the town procurement side, we Hi. did put in... in I do not have an outside voice. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> we did put together an invitation for bid that went out today. It was, actually yesterday, it was advertised in the paper. It's also available on the town website where we are looking to bring in outside vendors 
to utilize them a little bit more to do enrichment programs. So the reason we needed to take this approach is we've always utilized outside vendors, but because we're looking to expand, expand it and really try to bring down the wait list, the dollar amounts that we would be paying the vendors have tripped us to a point where we need to actually do a former, formal invitation for bid. Um, I say I'm very impressed that we how we've done this is we're able to structure it such that we're accepting people that want to propose on this. We've basically given a menu approach so that we have a whole variety of options available from sports to culinary to science, science to drama. STEM to drama. So we've really opened it up so that we're hoping to be able to draw a lot of folks into it. So the bid closes on September 11th. We will be meeting to go through all of the people who proposed under it. We'll be checking their references. We want to make sure that we're bringing in quality programs. There are requirements in here that they meet the student to instructor ratios. Everyone will be quarried. So we're making sure that we have everything mm -hmm. in that. So probably not at the next school committee meeting because it'll be right after the bids close, but shortly thereafter we'll be able to give an update. But we do feel that this will allow us to open up a lot more slots because we'll be able to utilize out outside vendors. We're doing it for a year long term this time because we want to see how it yeah. works. So um, we're, we're very hopeful that this will alleviate some of the pressure as well. Yes. When you say it'll be for a year long term, do you mean that these vendors will yeah. commit to doing their program for an for entire year? year? So no one's going to be year. surprised. From so. October to the red end of the school year. Yep. And so kids will be able, families will be able to register for the entire year. It won't be changing. And this will be offered as part of our regular extended day program. It is not above and beyond that. It'll, it's all part of the tuition that people are paying. The fees that they're paying for the program are those will not change. This is just how we're able to staff it differently. And the first priority would go to the wait list. Correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll know better how many people from the wait list. Parents have been notified that our hope is that this would, would begin in October. Um, so some folks are cobbling it together for September. And, I, and just another caveat, some of the people that are on the wait list um, have been given partial placement. So say they asked for five mornings and five afternoons, they may have gotten all mornings and two afternoons or something. That's part of uh, the way they work uh, the registration process because we have to kind of meld families together and look at spaces. There are a lot of families that want all five days and we don't always have five spaces, five days, and then we have different sibling scenarios. So it's, it's a complex process. It's not just first come, first serve which it is, you know, we certainly do a priority registration and the, the quicker you get it in, the, the better your chances, but it's not that, you know, some people are like, well, I was here at eight and I still didn't get all my days, mm -hmm. but there's a reason for that. Um, we're working really hard. I think this RFP, kudos to Gail um, and Sandy Calandrella and her team um, in Extended Day because this was really a complex process. It wasn't just a standard RFP. Um, we're really trying to grow it so that we can continue to grow it. We do not want to have this wait list situation every year. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, this probably won't alleviate every single spot, but it's a growth model and it's one that hopefully will work well and then we can expand on it. Um, the enrichments can allow different people. Some of them have different sports venues that allow different um, numbers of kids or we have three or four things going on at once or we're gonna try different scheduling things and just try to keep tweaking it. But you know, our number one focus is safety, quality programming, I mean, folks are trusting their kids. These are the same kids we have all day, right? These, the, like our responsibility doesn't end at 2.30. You know, they're, they're our babies until they're your babies. So um, we, wanna make, we wanna make this right. Okay. Any questions about that? I'll just say I applaud it. I mean, I, I think it's kind of an ingenious idea to add more, add more to it. I, I can probably guarantee that Nick Face and his program is going to apply, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, almost if he hasn't already. Um, but you know, probably, yeah. um, I think it's it's a really in, ingenious way to look at it. I only wish it, we had thought about it a little earlier, but I, that is what it is, right? Sometimes that just happens. Um, and I think <clears throat> the more we're able to demonstrate that value, the more we're able to satisfy that yeah. that 
part of our community. And that, like you've said, is a growing port part of our community. More and more are double income families. And that's this is when that's needed, is that kind of thing, so. So it, um, it sounds like that what you were describing though in terms of how you structured it, it's gonna be scalable. So that this that process could be. The hope would be yeah. that we could continue to grow, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank space you. is not an issue anymore. I mean, space is an issue in the sense that, you know, our schools are heavily used and some teachers stay late and, you know, it's not just a panacea of like, oh, we have 23 classrooms, we have 23 spaces. It, you know, we're definitely trying to be mindful of respecting um, spaces that are used regularly. We already use a lot of the communal spaces, um, like cafeterias, gym spaces, um, libraries in some cases, some of the music and art rooms. So, so we'll definitely look at that. Working very closely with all the building principles and looking at how creative we can yeah. be with the programs we're bringing yeah. in, the spaces we have available. So it's been a very, well, I agree, you know, it's great to try to get out ahead of it as much as you can. There are a lot of logistic yeah. pieces mm -hmm. and parts, yeah. and mm -hmm. I will say we went through many iterations of this to oh, yeah. write it in such a way that we knew we would get the best responses we could yep. and allow us to have as many options as we could. So it definitely, it was, it's a learning process, and we, you know, we, I think we're moving in the right direction with it. So um, you mentioned Corey, but is it Corey Sorry for the comp for any, any Every, anybody so that both. walks it's in the Corey building? Corey and yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's not just the lead person; it's yeah, anybody, anybody that's there. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so that's why we're also it. It is a process. To and go we will still this. have our staff, of course. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the quality staff that folks love at the schools, they'll they'll still be there. But uh, yeah, these are more enrichment yeah. type programs. All right, um, so as uh, Mrs. Downing mentioned, uh, we worked on curriculum guides. I, I do have to say thank you for the wonderful praise, uh, Marianne, but I do have to say that um, really the kudos goes to the high school teams. Um, the, I worked with the leadership team last year and really kind of outlined you know, the template that I wanted them to use and really how to write essential questions and a couple of um, department heads actually came to a training day with me this summer on their own time to learn more about how to work on curriculum development. So, I mean, it's a powerful team. Um, the, the, my STEM director and humanities director have also assisted in this role. They've worked really well uh, with the department heads, which has been a nice collaboration since they're working K to eight, and then now they're kind of helping with the high school. So if you haven't checked out yet, if you look on the learning and teaching website, um, on the website there are, uh, as Maria mentioned, there's a tab for high school curriculum guides. All of the core subjects are there, and I do have to say some of them look different. So you might notice like some of them have honors classes, some just have like history nine. Um, that was really up to the department, how they wanted to write them. Um, some of them, the nuances between levels look differently, but they really don't affect the actual guide. They're looking at the state standards. We still have the same state standards. If you're in history 10, it doesn't matter if you're in honors history 10 or um, you know, the standard uh, strong college prep 10, it's still the same essential questions. It, it just may be worded differently or different projects or things like that. And some of that you'll notice if you look in the guides, it actually called that out. Some departments decided to do different ones. So like English really felt like some of the honors classes looked very different than the strong college preps depending on what books they used or different themes that they used. They all follow the state standards, but some of them are well, all of them are enhanced beyond the state standards, um, but to varying degrees. So we have um, five English curriculum guides uh, for 9, 10, and 11. We have three history guides for uh, 9, 10, and 11. We have six math guides for algebra 1 and 2. Um, some of them are at honors levels, geometry, honors, and uh, strong college prep geometry, as well as uh, pre-calculus. Uh, we have three science um, curriculum guides, and then we started to post our other curriculum guides. We have five from the health and wellness department, um, and we're still the um, music and art ones just were re revised at the state level this summer, um, and they had worked on some of them from the from the old <laughs> uh, standards. So we're actually going to tweak those before they go out. We have not done all the electives, so th these are not all the courses at Reading High. Those are going to be worked on as well. Um, in addition, uh, 
whoops, the next step are to complete guides, obviously, in the electives at the high school, as well as work with the high school teams on curriculum documents that are shared in-house, things like pacing, unit plans, assessments. Those are all those teacher documents I've talked about. Um, again, most of the departments have plenty of them, but not memorialized and not centralized. So our job is to really take all of that really rich quality stuff, kind of look at, at it systemically, make sure it jives, and then memorialize it so that we have it for like ease of use. You're a new math teacher, here you go. This is where you're going, this, this is the rich bank, and we're gonna continue to add to it. Um, curriculum guides in middle school are gonna be started. Uh, so I'm in the process of contacting new middle, sc middle school curriculum leads, uh, which will help support that work, and we're gonna do some training days on how to help support their teams in writing the guides, and what essential questions, how do you develop, how do you look at the standards, and kind of what are your power standards, all of that. Um, Heather Leonard and uh, Allison, Straker are gonna help me with that training, which is awesome. So we're gonna be working with the middle school teams on that. We also have to do elementary social studies this year. Uh, as you know, the social studies standards changed. We, we focused on updating middle school social studies. Um, we did hire a consultant to help us look uh, systemically at the, scene, at the um, high school um, curriculum to make sure that that was sort of an integrated approach the way the state wants it. The good news is we already had an integrated approach, so we're really close to where we need to be. We just have to make some minor tweaks, which is awesome. Um, we are focusing a lot on uh, middle school um, curriculum and social studies. We did order National Geographic, which is the gold standard. Um, thanks to Gail and her procurement, we were able to get those, um, and National Geographic offered us a competitive price, I thought. We uh, didn't realize we were gonna bring in multiple vendors, and when we heard National Geographic's offer to us, we jumped at it because they really are the gold standard um, in sixth and seventh grade, and we have not had new history books in middle school for a very long time, and this came with everything. So when we were in the budget process <clears throat> we were talking about the mm -hmm. civics uh, curriculum and really not having any there wasn't really any materials out there is that what so you're what we've just decided to do is we didn't purchase anything major for eighth grade civics we did send uh, some folks to some training days last year and then over the summer we uh, have the first two units I think outlined we did buy some what we're calling resources so, for instance, there is a resource that some districts are using. We bought one class set that we're gonna try it out. We didn't wanna make a huge investment um, with the civics because really the Massachusetts Civics Unit is brand new and most of the publishers have not gotten ahead of it. Um, and we just didn't wanna invest a lot of money in things until we're really sure what fits for us. But our eighth grade um, civics team, the two, two teachers at both schools are on it. And, um, and Heather, um, not Heather, Allison Stryker is sort of leading that charge with them. Um, but we're really confident that we're gonna have a really good plan for this year and try out some of these resources that we've purchased. We've also bought some um, other like uh, multiple copies of books that align to like what is democracy or you know like a class set of those kind of things. So we're, we're giving it a whirl. Um, we did not, there's no like textbook like National Geographic. They, they have not developed one. So. Chuck. Any? Yeah. Um, do we have rough time frames for the high school to, to be completed and then rough time frames for completion of middle? So for the curriculum guides? Yes. So uh, my goal for this year is to have all the middle school curriculum guides done this year. Okay. By the end of the school year or by the end of the summer, depending on. <laughs> but I said the end of the school year for the high school and it did take us all summer to edit them and, and, and really make sure they were publishable quality. I really wanted them to look their best. Um, the elementary social studies absolutely will be done by the end of the summer. We may need the summer to do elementary social studies next summer. We may have to put a team together for that. There aren't a lot of changes in elementary, but there are enough. Um, and I, I know how elementary folks are. They're gonna wanna really digest that. So, and they should. Um, the middle school ones will be done. The high school electives, I, I'm gonna be honest with you, John, I think those will come in dribs and drabs. Um, some departments are ready to go. Like I know, you know, the art music, we will have them probably this fall. But then we might be still working on, you know, like statistics or uh, accounting or those kind of things. Health. Yeah, so, well, the health and wellness are all done. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting there. Yeah. But um, I would love to tell you they'll be all done 
for the end of the school year, they need to all be done before NEAS comes in December of 2020. So they will be done by then. <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of electives at Reading High, um, and some of them are taught by one person, and these curriculum guides take a long time to write. They really do. I mean, they don't look, they're only two pages, but to get them really right and really look at sort of like what are those power standards, what are the guiding principles, what are the essential questions, it takes a lot of time to do them. So we want to do them well. Um, and again, they're still editable. These right. are not set in stone, you know. Uh, hopefully they'll, they'll be great systems that people can continue to update. But yeah, I would say all of them will be done by December of 2020 district-wide. Oh, and, and pre-K. We're starting pre-K, too. Oh, <laughs> Other than that, not much. Um, let's see. Middle school math update. So we had a team of Reading educators uh, volunteer some time to look at some math curriculums. Um, we, the program that we used is going out of print. Um, Mrs. Downing actually came and talked to us quite a bit, uh, had some questions, which was great for us to get a sense of uh, what folks might be thinking. Um, and we are, what we've decided to do is a pilot this year, which is a unit-based structure. And how does that differ? So typically when you do a pilot, often you do like everyone does this book or everyone does this. What we've decided is to have different teachers voluntarily decide to do different units. So I might decide to do the fractions unit, you might decide to do the geometry unit, and then we are going to have the same kind of rubric rating scale so that we can really make some great assessments on like what were the benefits of this program, what, um, what you know, what are things that we didn't like about it. Our next steps uh, after that is going to be ongoing PD and training, including feedback and data collection on the use of the tools that we're training everyone in how to use this, and also um, having meetings with all the stakeholders, the, the math teachers in seven and eight to get recommendations on um, you know, what they think. So we will definitely be making a presentation at the school committee uh, at some point um, as this pilot progresses. But we should have a plan moving forward of what math program we will be recommending um, by the end of the school year for sure. Yes. Probably know where my question's coming from already. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Ma uh, Massachusetts curriculum evaluation standard now, Curate, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and how that applies to other evolving new yep. standard and evaluation tools like Ed Reports, Louisiana Believes, or things yep. along those lines, and these two platforms and programs we've chosen yep. where they fit in that process? So, um, yes, yeah, so that is one way we look at it. Uh, the Curate is relatively new. The state is still doing an optional database housing system of programs uh, that if folks are using and then really giving feedback. So like these are the preferred programs, not recommended, but preferred. Uh, Massachusetts has never done that. So you could live in a town next door and know nothing about it. And you had to really do your own research. So if you were a program that used Pearson Math, you would literally have to call the districts and say like, what do you use? What do you use? What do you? We don't have the time to do that. So mm -hmm. they're really asking uh, communities voluntarily to give that information and give honest feedback. Like this is really expensive but we love it or this is you know um, financially a, a good program for our community but it has its pitfalls or somewhere in between right because it, all of it goes in uh, what I can tell you is that the rubrics that we developed to look at curriculum materials in social studies and uh, math which are the two programs that have been worked on since I've been here um, we used a rubric that I created uh, formerly in my last district using the ed reports model. So we look at the same kind of things like um, ease of differentiation, use of technology, ease of teacher use, uh, editable, you know, things, all of those pieces, right? Um, as well as how it, it is ranked. Now ed reports does rank things. I have heard you mention about Louisiana Beliefs. It's not something I have used in my other hats that I've used. Um, ed reports definitely has that sort of, you know, green, yellow, red code um, the problem with some of that is some of them, Ed Reports isn't always 100% open. Like you might not be able to see the middle school version of this program or um, things like that. So it, it's definitely something we look at. Uh, it's not, I, to be honest with you, the experts are our teachers, right? Um, and and I'm, I'll be quite honest with you, Mr. Weiss, there are some financial limitations. Some of the programs that are really well received um, and, and some cities have more grant funding and things like that. 
you know, those things, if we, it, we don't try to make that our vision, but there are things that if we know a program is going to be three times more expensive, we may have to really caution against that. I, I'll, that's part of why National Geographic was like, I don't think anyone was more excited. I mean, Gail will tell you how excited was I. I, was like, I didn't even think it was a financial, I didn't even want them to come because I was like, why fall in love with that? It was like, you know, visiting a $2 million house and then settling on a trailer. Like, I was like, you know, I, I just was like, I don't think we're going to be able to afford it. And the fact, and, and the reality is our costs are high. I mean, curriculum materials are really expensive. So we do have to look at our taxpayers' use of money. And our, our teachers here are really good at taking what they have and making it work. So I want to hear from them what they think. I, I will tell you that the two programs that we're um, kind of dating right now, um, that we feel good about them. So. Is that it? Nope, I have more. <laughs> And yes, there's more. No, no, please. I um, so uh, let's see. Civics, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, oh, our behavioral health coach uh, also helped with our induction week. She did our, we, as I'm sure you know, uh, we do youth mental health first aid training for every new employee. We are also still working to train every single employee in the Reading Public Schools. We're getting very close. Each year we kind of tick away. Um, with all of the staff, um, including, you know, everyone who works in the schools. Uh, so we're, she's really working really hard on that. She's also become an open circle trainer. Uh, Opal's, open circle is a wonderful social emotional training. Again, a very expensive training model. Um, they recently allowed people to become train the trainers. Um, so we sent her to training so that she can train in house and we don't have to send people out. Um, so she's really excited to be able to do that. She also went to restorative justice training, um, and uh, she actually is now certified as an inter in International Institute of Rest Restorative Justice Trainer and Restorative Circles. So she's going to be working with the middle schools and the high school on um, implementing that pr practice. Uh, she also does all our um, QBS is that yeah. training, which is our de-escalation. Um, First aid, you know, what do we do when um, when we need to de-escalate? Uh, so she does all of that training for all of our staff. She's already trained. We also train everyone extended day uh, in both um, first aid, youth mental health first aid, and QBS, which is awesome. Um, so she's been very, very involved. She And kind of one other exciting thing is she's working with the middle school and maybe the high school to bring the movie Angst to the school. Um, which I haven't seen it yet, but I hear it's awesome. We're going to try to have a screening this year, and it's all about um, raising the stigma of anxiety, um, raising, de, de emphasizing the stigma, <laughs> and raising awareness against the stigma of anxiety that everyone has anxiety and really having those conversations. So she saw the movie, she loved it, and she really wants to bring it um, to the schools. Um, and our data coach has been looking at our data. Obviously, our MCAS scores are still embargoed, but I will be reporting on that. She's starting to dissect all of that. Um, we're also working on an um, analytics platform um, to look at data so that we have like a dashboard for uh, the elementary schools so when they look at data, they're not looking at multiple sources um, and hand-created graphs that took many hours. Uh, this will be able, teachers will be able to input the information in real time and really see immediately. Uh, what the data points look like. So, as you can see, we've been um, pretty busy around here. Um, just a huge, again, huge shout out to uh, the learning and teaching team, um, as well as the central office team, um, to just get these pieces in place. Summer's a busy time for us, uh, and it's been a good one. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. That. Last and update. So we don't do not have an executive session tonight. So that that's should we actually hit our future business item since we talked about that last time we met? What is it? Yeah. Having a discussion about what to have as future business. What? Last, uh, during our last, uh, I'll lean forward, although usually I don't have a projection problem. Um, <laughs> during our last meeting when we had our, our mask director here, we talked about the fact that we should make sure we hit the future business items so that any one of us can raise items that we think we should discuss or, you know, 
of debate or have a presentation on whether it's by one of us or somebody else in the community as the case may be. So, just so what did you want for a few since? Well, since I raised the question, um, there's a couple of things that we've talked about in the past that we have not yet um, really gone through far, too far with yet, uh, and that's um, one is the decoding dys dys ah, I can't even speak it out loud. Decoding dyslexia early identification, um, which is supposed to be uh, live this fall. No, um, actually, the state's giving another year. The state might yes. The state is the state is saying yes. There's some interesting problems there from a funding perspective, right? Um, but I, I think my point there is I think we should have some conversations. Maybe it's not till spring, but have some conversations about what we might be looking at or what's up, what else is going on. We in that already space. have a plan that will be presented. Well, that's awesome. So great. <laughs> We're on it. We're on it. <laughs> I know you are. You're always on top of it. Um, and the other the other one is is uh, to in line with the last conversation we had is other things that have been going on in the media. And you guys are probably already on top of this as well. And that's Emily Hannaford's most recently most recently published article, A Loss for Words, mm -hmm. which is about uh, reading, teaching, and things like that. Um, hits a little bit or quite directly at many of the tools that we use. Um, whether we agree with it or not, I think it's just worth having a, an a discussion about it. To get I'm happy to have Allison come and talk about that. I, I also know that Emily Hannaford is an she is not an educator; she's mm -hmm. a uh, reporter. So, I, you know, I just want to caution folks. I mean, she raised some great things that, um, in the article, and she raised some things that I was like, hmm. So, I think it would be great to have our literacy expert for the district come and talk a little bit about that because she has her own perspective on that as a. a career educator in literacy but and I'd love to love yeah. to have that perfect and there's others that we could have come in as well as part of that conversation or anything else along those lines um, yeah Emily is obviously just a reporter uh, but she just did just win a re an award for that reporting um, recently um, and there's a lot of research behind that so there's a lot of research on both sides but it's just again from a school committee perspective us having the, the understanding and being on the same page mm -hmm. um, etc as, as the case may be so Okay. Those are the two I'd like to see if we can talk about at some point. Yes. Um, Dr. Doxer, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm Linda, too. <laughs> two things. One is something that keeps getting pushed down the road is the school committee brochure. It was brought up in 2014, and there's a draft that's been updated um, multiple years. And so to be able to put that on the agenda so that we can finalize it and have it as a resource for people who are wondering what we do in a nutshell. Like, um, and I can to send the committee you. thing. Sorry? It was like welcome to the committee so that people would have something and understand so what to said, expect. You said there's something out there? Um, there was something before 2014 and that's been edited and I can send you a copy of the edit that's there. So it would be great to put that on the agenda. And then the other thing that I didn't mention that I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Chris Kelly and Grant Hightower and all of our, um, the teachers and the administrators and the families from Boston and the families from Reading yeah. who attended the um, Metco, the Reading, Friends of Reading Metco pool party and barbecue that we had another booming success and it was wonderful to have a group that worked together for that and then work together to clean that up and to have an agenda for that organization that's forming now, working with Mr. Hightower to have multiple events during the year. So that was the first event for this year, but there's going to be um, get togethers, there's gonna to be of families and then get togethers for parents, we're gonna have the uh, Friends of Reading Metco Choir again for the Martin Luther King Day. Um, and we're gonna work on a partner program that used to be known as a host family program, but mm -hmm. to bring equity and inclusion into the language that we're trying to use, we're gonna talk about partnerships because we're partners between the cities to make this a successful program. So stay tuned and um, at some point it would be great to have them on the agenda. Maybe Mr. Hightower and, and the Friends of Reading Metco could talk, probably not really soon because just getting up to speed, but eventually. 
So that's a thank you and excitement about where we're going with that. Well, Linda, thank you for, and uh, Mark for hosting that event. It's it's a great event, and thank you, John, for uh, attending as well. I mean, it was really it's it's a wonderful day at the uh, at the Doxers, and I didn't use the pool. Uh, I won't ever be using the pool publicly, <laughs> That's okay. but it is lovely. Um, and uh, um, to that point, Lois, Coach Lois Margeson <laughs> would keep you safe if you did use the pool. She's been awesome right. for I don't know the last four or five years. Yeah, she's great. Um, and the yeah, hamburgers and, were delicious. So and thank, thank you. you to the funder, the PTO has chipped in, and Pegasus Springs is pitching in, and Reading Cooperative Bank provided the waters, and then there were little individual donations to help us make it a free event for everyone. Including the Reading Teachers Association. Including the Reading Teachers Association. Thank you. And all the families. Yeah. Anybody who came right. brought something. So. Thank you to everybody that came and made it a success. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Uh, second. <laughs> Six zero. Thank you, everyone.